Hi, and uh, welcome to Data Driven 2021. Uh, our fourth time doing this, and obviously the first time doing it fully online with a few hiccups. So uh, I'm David Weiss. I'm the uh, director of uh, Humber College's Story Lab, a collaborative hub for data driven storytelling. And I would, uh, yeah, just like to welcome you. This is going to be a really fun day of uh, really cool data journalism stories focused on, on Canadian stories, but also with some special guests uh, from the, around the world as well. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to do a shout out to the 2021 Sigma Awards which is the uh, largest uh, data journalism award ceremony kind of uh, in, uh, in the world. And uh, they're still accepting applications, including from Canadians. So uh, if you are watching this and are a data journalist or someone who does data journalism, uh, please, uh, you can still, there's still time to apply by February 1st. And you can go to sigmaawards.org. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's a really, uh, really, really cool, sponsored by the Google News Initiative and a bunch of other news organizations. And I'd also like to give a quick shout out, we don't have slides for this to seem, but to uh, Computation Plus Journalism, the uh, symposium that's being hosted uh, next month in, in February by uh, Northeastern University, and of course the annual NICAR conference uh, from which this uh, takes some liberal inspiration from, which is happening in March. So from there, uh, I'd like to go and uh, pass the mic over to uh, Guillermo Acosta, our, the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Media and Creative Arts to do a land acknowledgement. Thank you so much, David. And uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Data Driven is, uh, is an event that is uh, always uh, an incredibly rich uh, learning experience and uh, and listening to the stories and listening to all the work that has been done behind the scenes to bring the truth to the journalism. It's it's uh, amazing and 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 really um, uh, brings light to to uh, dark times. So I'm, I'm happy that we're here to support this. But before uh, further ado, I'd like to um, do a land acknowledgement. And uh, starting with uh, quoting the, some of the, the words of uh, Jason C. Wright, our Dean of Indigenous Education and Engagement. Uh, we want to welcome you to the traditional lands that Humber College is located on. We do this to honor and respect the ancestors who lived on this land before us and currently still reside in this area. Humber invites you to join us in recognizing the living history of the land on which we are located and order our connection to it. And recognizing that uh, this is an online event and you can be well across the world, I'm going to read the, the formal statement or the, of the basic land acknowledgement from where Humber is situated. Humber College is located within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobico, the place of the elders in Mississaugas language. The region is uniquely situated along Humber River watershed with which historically provided an integral connection for Anish Navi, Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples between the Ontario Lecture and the Lake Simcoe, Georgia Bay regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobico continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. And it's always for me an honor to do the, to do this ritual, that the, the line acknowledgement is something that I take with honor and, and uh, responsibility and with great respect. There are three aspects that are highlights for me by doing this. One is gratefulness, uh, interconnection, and commitment to future generations. As a settler in this land, I'm, I'm grateful, but I'm also humbled for all the opportunities that this land has provided me. And I'm very respectful of the legacy of uh, indigenous peoples and grateful for the learnings that they have passed on and, and, and conscious of all I had to learn the relationship I have to to build and the, the wounds that I, I am committed to help heal. Interconnection for me is about our connection to the land, but also our connections with each other through meaningful relationship building. And lastly is my commitment to build a better future for the generations to come, to leave the land in the, in the, in the best, in, in, a, in, in a better place, to leave our relations in a better place for generations to come. So it's, it's something that for me is, is is, is a very important thing to do 
and uh, an aspect that we need to take into account uh, when when we um, um, continue developing uh, our work in this in this land. So thank you, thank you for the opportunity to do this, and uh, looking forward to a great day of uh, learning and uh, and working. Thank you, thank you, David. Pass it back to you. Yep. Thank you, Guillermo. And yeah, just to remind uh, right before we get started that uh, yeah, Story Lab is sponsored by uh, the Faculty of Media and Creative Arts, as well as the Faculty of Applied Research and Innovation here at Humber College. So we're running a little bit late, but that's fine. Uh, with, uh, it's my pleasure now, without further ado, to introduce you to uh, Giancarlo Fiorella to, to get us started. Uh, Giancarlo is a senior investigator and trainer at Bellingcat. And he is also a doctoral candidate at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto. Hi, thank you so much for um, that introduction and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk to you today. I'm really excited. I've been really looking forward to this uh, talk. So I'm really happy to be here uh, and hi to everybody. As you heard from David, I'm a senior investigator at Bellingcat, um, which is an open source digital investigation organization. And what I want to do today is talk to you just a little bit about what Bellingcat is and the, the sort of work that we do. So what is open source research? Uh, what's the kind of investigation that we might conduct and publish at Bellingcat? And I want to talk to you um, in greater detail about a project that we've been working on since the start of the month, and that has to do with the Capitol riot. Um, as you'll see in a couple minutes, um, we have a database of user generated content from this event that we are organizing in, an, in a database that we are making public so anyone can access it. And the idea is that this database will be a space for us to work to locate each piece of media that came out from the Capitol on January 6th, not just in place, but also in time. And so uh, what we're going to do is uh, go through that and then um, I'm going to end off with a couple of lessons or things to keep in mind when uh, working with open source, uh, crowdsourced information as, as um, um, I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and these lessons, I suppose, are drawn not just directly from our experiences with this Capital Riot database over the last couple of weeks, but also more generally uh, from the kind of work that we do at Bellingcat regularly. I'm going to talk for about, I think, maybe 20 minutes. And then after that, I'm really eager to uh, answer any questions or comments that you might have. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, OK, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see. There we go. I think you can see that. Uh, yes, probably. OK, so instead of having slides, um, you know, to talk about like open source research and what is it? I thought that I would just show you the homepage of Bellingcat and go over just really quickly a couple of um, resources and articles that we published recently to give you an idea again of the kind of work that we do here. So the latest uh, publication that we have is from yesterday. And it has to do, it's part of a, a, a broader research thread that we have going at the moment into the poisoning of Navalny, who's a Russian political figure. And this latest report uh, implicates uh, individuals with a Russian state security agency in the killing of other uh, Russian activists. So uh, Navalny survived his Novichok poisoning, uh, but what this article outlines is um, other uh, suspected um, assassinations, uh, three of them uh, in this case being successful. So that's uh, the latest report that we have up. It's, um, um, it's been up for a couple hours now. Um, we also have um, this article. This is having to do with the Capitol riot, and this is a um, reconstruction, we can say, of Ashley Babbitt's journey, not just uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, but also her journey from somebody who claims to have voted for Obama at one point to somebody who became radicalized into the QAnon conspiracy theory and uh, to the point that she participated in the storming of the Capitol. So if you don't know who she is, she's the woman who was killed um, um, during the Capitol riot uh, by a, a police officer there uh, while trying to um, enter the speaker's lobby inside the Capitol. So um, this report, as with uh, 
most of the work that we do at Bellingcat is looking at um, user generated content, as I mentioned earlier, that came out of the Capitol. So we're pouring through videos, we're pouring through pictures of the Capitol riot, and we're spotting her in the crowd at different moments, tracing her journey inside the Capitol from the moment that she entered the building to the moment that she approached the speaker's lobby, which is uh, where she was shot and um, uh, killed. And then we also have a couple of pieces on QAnon. Um, so January has been, I guess, QAnon slash Capital Riot Month at, at Bellingcat because it's been such an important, um, unprecedented event. Um, so we have an article here on um, exposed email logs that show connections between um, the owner of 8Coon, which is a website with QAnon influencers. And then uh, this article here from earlier in the month, from January 7th, looks at the development of QAnon uh, by looking at archived 4chan posts. So this is sort of breaking down. Okay, so who is this QAnon person? How did that how did this develop as uh, a thing that grew to become um, unfortunately really important in uh, US politics? Um, and we're seeing increasingly politics uh, around the world as well. So um, Bellingcat works with, as I said, open source information. That is any information that is uh, available online. So it can be social media posts, pictures and videos that people share on Twitter, like the ones that we saw in the article about Ashley Babbitt. It can be messages that people write on on message boards like 4chan, for example. Um, we also have resources. So there's a, a resource here that was written by one of my colleagues, and it's explaining how to determine when a video was taken based on the position of shadows using open source tools. So again, these are tools that are freely available online that anyone can access. So that's Bellingcat in a super quick glance. Um, to summarize it, we work with open source information that is information that is freely available on the internet that anybody with an internet connection can access. And we um, um, conduct research with that information and then we publish uh, findings based on that. So. What I want to talk to you today about today is uh, one of our uh, ongoing projects at the moment, and that is the uh, sh database of media from the uh, January 6th event at the Capitol. So what you're looking at here is a public uh, database that we put together. We're working on it. Um, we have, uh, I think 600, is it 600 entries? No, it's 300. Yeah, almost 400 entries, as you can see here. Uh, and we have uh, more in a in a submission backlog that I'll talk to you about in a minute. And so what we have here is a collection of, of user generated content for the most part. So that includes videos and pictures that people who were at the Capitol on January 6th took and they shared on Parler, they shared on Twitter, on Facebook Live, uh, you know, on YouTube, um, all of their social media accounts. And what we're doing is we're putting uh, this in one place so uh, anybody can access it. So there's an open database. And the idea here is that um, because this is curated, what we're able to do is review all of the material and then, uh, for example, give it a description. So without having to click on the link, you can read what is in the link. Is it a video? Is it a picture? If so, where was it taken? What does it show? Um, and really crucial to this effort as well is the archiving of this information. So what tends to happen in a high profile event, like for example, the storming of the Capitol, is that um, information gets deleted. So people will share information uh, on their social media accounts and then either the platform will delete a video or a picture because it's too violent or because it violates the terms of service in some way, or the individual who shared the image will later sort of get cold feet and they'll say, mm, maybe I shouldn't have taken all those selfies of myself uh, storming the Capitol because I could get in trouble. So I'm going to delete them from my Twitter account or I'm going to delete them from Facebook. So what we're trying to do here is identify those kinds of materials and archive them to make sure that even if they are deleted on the original platform that shared them, we still have copies of them. So that includes pulling videos from YouTube and Twitter and Facebook, for example, and it also involves using uh, tools like the Wayback Machine or archive.today to take snapshots of websites, like for example, tweets, uh, so that again, if they are deleted, we still have evidence that they existed at some point. 
So this has been a big team effort um, because uh, we're doing all of this mostly manually. Um, and the uh, other purpose, aside from archiving and having everything in a centralized uh, location for people to access, is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we want to be able to place these videos and this media both precisely in place, uh, but also in time. So with every single video, with every single picture, we want to be able to say this picture was taken exactly at this location in the Capitol. So this was it was this office or this video was taken precisely at this corner, you know, of Pennsylvania Avenue and Constitution Avenue. We want to do that with locations and we also want to be able to do that with time. So, um, you know, imagine that we have what well, we have, as you, said, as you saw, 388 URLs. Some of them contain multiple videos, multiple pictures. The idea would be to put them all in chronological order and say this is the first image that we have, you know, showing the very first moment that the crowd first charged the West Front uh, steps of the Capitol. And this video shows the instant that the crowd broke through the East Front gate. And by doing that, what we hope to be able to do is to create a, a full visual account of what happened from the very beginning to the very end when the police were clearing the crowd out of the building late into the evening of January 6. I'm going to show you how that is working in a couple minutes. Um, I, wa I wanted to mention as well this submissions uh, form. So we have a form that we uh, put on, on, on our Twitter account, and this form was created as a crowdsourcing effort. So we were asking people on Twitter that if they came across a picture or a video from the Capitol on January 6th, that they submitted to us. So we asked them for the URL. So we're getting YouTube videos, we're getting uh, links to tweets and, and Facebook Live uh, videos. Um, we're asking the uh, individuals who are submitting information to write a brief description of what it is that the video or the image shows. And you know, if they're able to, if they can archive it themselves, give it a, an approximate time and like the video, et cetera. And so all of these submissions make it into a submission file that we have here. And then we go through this. Um, uh, we have a team of not just uh, Bellingcat staff, but also volunteers who are going through this. And uh, you know, checking for duplicates um, um, and deciding whether or not the media corresponds to the Capital Rider event or not. And if it does, then we move it to this main media sheet, which again, everyone has access to and, and can uh, review. So um, I'm going to show you really quickly um, the work uh, of organizing the material into like smaller chunks that are actually digestible because again here we have 388 uh, individual URLs but some of those contain multiple videos as I mentioned earlier okay so how do we work with this to place it in time to place media in time and, and space as I mentioned earlier so uh, one way that we're doing it <coughs> excuse me is uh, we are dividing the materials by the location at which they were filmed. So there's lots of videos from the Washington Monument, for example, which is where Trump had to stop the steel rally the, the morning of January 6. Uh, there's tons of footage. I think most of the footage comes from the West Front entrance of the Capitol, but there's also lots of footage from the interior, from the North Door, the House Chamber, et cetera. So what we're doing is we're splitting the materials from that main sheet that you just saw into these, um, as I said, sort of more bite-sized, uh, digestible chunks. And then um, at the moment, so this is what I worked on uh, yesterday for the most part, uh, we're trying to organize them first sort of in rough time categories. So um, this is the media for the East Front section of the Capitol. It's all been collected here and I've divided it roughly into media that shows the scenes at the East Front entrance of the Capitol before the East Front was breached, which looks like it happened between 2 and 2.30 in the afternoon. So any media showing like the protest before the breach occurred, media showing the breach happening. So people shoving through the East Front door, people inside the East Front lobby, and then any media showing the effort to clear the crowd out of the East Front, um, which typically from what I saw started to happen 
roughly after 4, 4.35 p.m. So after these broad um, categories are, um, after we organize the data into these broad categories, what we can do is we can get more granular. So we can go back into every single media, every single picture and every single video, and then we can start correlating videos with one another, for example, to get a, a, a clearer picture of exactly when each picture was taken. Sometimes we get lucky and there are pictures, for example, from, from Flickr, which is a photograph uh, sharing site, and these pictures will have metadata attached to them. So you'll be able to see exactly when the what clock the DSLR camera that took the picture showed, what time it showed when the picture was taken. And so that's really useful because it helps us to, to get an idea for exactly when an image was taken. But most of the images here don't have any associated metadata in that sense, because when you upload an image to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, any social media website, basically YouTube, um, those sites delete metadata. So then we're going by contextual cues. Sometimes the person in the tweet will say, I just took this picture, like this just happened right now. And so we can kind of go by, by the time that the tweet was posted, for example, if somebody says, I just took this picture, this just happened. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, what we can do is we can start, as I said earlier, correlating uh, evidence in the video. So for example, at the east front, um, some of the material shows fire trucks present at the site but some of the materials don't show fire trucks present at the site. That's because a couple of fire trucks showed up to the east front gate later in the day. So if we're going through material and we don't know, is this from early morning or late afternoon? Uh, we can't really tell. That would be a contextual cue. If there's a fire truck in the image, it's from the afternoon because there was no fire trucks there in the morning, that sort of thing. So this is quite, uh, this can be pretty time consuming. So as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, a couple of people at Bellingcat working on this and also a really great team of volunteers who have uh, um, dedicated some time to this as well and they're helping out with it. So why are we doing this? Again, I mentioned earlier, we wanna be able to have a curated database that anyone can access at any point in the future. Um, you know, researchers, uh, I don't know, high school <laughs> students in 20 years who want to be able to see uh, what happened at the Capitol. Hopefully this this will be a resource for them. And also um, by um, locating videos in time and place, as I mentioned earlier, we are able to get a really uh, a full view of what happened at the Capitol uh, from the moment that the first individual showed up to the building to the moment that they um, the last of them were cleared out of the site. Um, I think, oh, the lessons, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Okay, so a couple of lessons from this. I did say that I was gonna talk about lessons. So I mentioned crowdsourcing earlier and uh, when I was talking about uh, this submission sheet here. <clears throat> so at Bellingcat, we, we use crowdsourcing uh, quite a bit. So what we'll do is, as we did in this case, we'll go on our Twitter account and we'll say, hi, Twitter, if you have a video from the Capitol that you ran across, please send it to us. We, we're collecting all of them. Uh, sometimes we ask uh, on Twitter, you know, we'll crowdsource a geolocation. So we're trying to determine where in Yemen a particular video was taken showing an airstrike. And we'll go on Twitter and we'll put the video up and we'll say, hi, Twitter, can you help us? Does anybody know, can anybody find out where exactly in Yemen this video of, the, of this airstrike was, was uh, taken? And uh, it, you know, if you read those, those uh, threads that we put out, you know, you'll see tons of people who are really dedicated and who have, uh, um, in this case, geolocation skills helping, right? Um, that's what we call crowdsourcing. So um, as I said, we, we rely on it quite a lot at, at Bellingcat. We believe that it is a, um, a useful tool for digital open source research. Um, um, lots of really great uh, journalism has been done thanks to crowdsourcing. I'm thinking specifically of the uh, uh, BBC Africa Eye um, anatomy of a killing video um, from um, I think it was last year or two years ago um, that determined where and when a really um, disturbing video of uh, uh, the execution of women and children in Cameroon was taken. That was uh, a really incredible achievement that was accomplished through crowdsourcing on Twitter. So one lesson is that crowdsourcing can be very helpful and useful for this kind of work. Another lesson is that um, there are other things for which crowdsourcing is maybe not as helpful and can be actually be dangerous. 
And we saw this quite a bit with this uh, case in particular, the Capitol riot. Uh, the crowdsourcing of identification efforts has the potential to go wrong um, quickly and has the potential to ruin people's lives through the misidentification of individuals. So I think understandably, lots of people saw what happened on January 6th at the Capitol and they were outraged by it. They just couldn't believe that a crowd of people could break into the Capitol and do what they did on that day. And so tons of people discovered open source research on January 6th because they all went on Twitter and they were angry and they said, I want to help. You know, what can I do to wrong to right this wrong that I've that I've seen? And um, if you uh, go th through Twitter and you look up, you know, like capital identification, capital, uh, you know, person uh, IDing, you'll see lots of threads of people who are uh, trying to identify individuals in the crowd at the Capitol. And when those efforts are taken, uh, are undertaken in public, when they're un undertaking under pressure, uh, you know, you can imagine getting excited because you think you've you've identified someone and you, you know, you name somebody in a Twitter thread and you say, I think the guy with the baseball bat in the Capitol video is John Smith and here's his Facebook account, right? When you get that wrong, John Smith, uh, can suffer a lot because you've misidentified him. You've implicated him in a high profile event when it turns out that he wasn't anywhere near the Capitol that day, right? So just as crowdsourcing can be extremely useful um, and helpful, I think it also, you know, we should also consider that some crowdsourcing tasks like the identification of individuals have the potential to cause uh, danger. And so I think we have to, you know, sort of take that uh, take the bad with the good, right? Or at least ask questions about when we are crowdsourcing tasks, what are the tasks that we should crowdsource? What should we discourage people from doing? What are things that we should not crowdsource? As for example, I've suggested uh, identification efforts. All right, I'm looking at my clock here and I'm at 20 minutes, 21 minutes. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take questions. All right. Um, so Giancarlo, I, uh, we've got some questions queued up here. And once again, if anyone would like to ask questions, uh, we have a built-in Q&A function here with Microsoft Teams. So you can actually just go and, and pop that uh, in. We have two queued up. First, we have uh, Kaylee Rogers. Uh, hey, Kaylee, uh, from 538. Uh, she asks, hey, Giancarlo, how do you deal with media where the exact timestamp and or location isn't clear? Yeah, so that's that's our bread and butter. Um, so the, the determining where a picture was taken is, is called uh, geolocation and determining when is called chronolocation. And um, those are techniques that we employ often uh, anytime that we're working with visual material. So um, as I said, sometimes you get really lucky and it's a picture on Flickr that has metadata so you can work on that. But most of the time, I would say over 90% of the time, you're working with information that has no metadata. So there are different tools and techniques that you can employ to chronolocate and geolocate images. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think in this particular event, we have a pretty clear indication of where things happen, right? <clears throat> so you can imagine, for example, um, you know, if I show you five random videos from the Capitol riot, you'll see that some of them have the Washington Monument in the background, right? So you'll you know, imagine the video, there's a big crowd, people are yelling. And then in the background of the image, you'll see the Washington doc Monument, right? So uh, you can say, well, if you open up Google Maps, you can go to the Capitol and you can see, okay, which side of the Capitol faces the, the, the Washington Monument? It's the west side of the Capitol, the, the west front. And so um, that is a, a really simple sort of geolocation that you can do. You look for cues in the image that tell you where that picture was taken. You know, you can turn that around and say, if I'm looking at a video and it's at the entrance of the Capitol and the Washington Monument is not in the background, that must have been taken at the east front or probably the north or the, or the south entrances. Um, that's geolocation. Chronolocation works sort of a similar, a similar way, uh, but it can be trickier. And so the example that I gave earlier is that, you know, say that we have 50 videos from the east front and we don't really know when they were taken. We have to order them. Um, what I showed you earlier, those rough categories that said before the attack, during the attack and after the attack, um, 
anything that was any media that shows like a very a very small crowd at the east front uh, and nobody up the steps we can say that was taken before the breach occurred right again we're looking at contextual cues that will tell us details about time rather than place uh, any image that where the lighting is a little bit darker and the capital lights are on was taken later in the afternoon, right? So we can place those in time later in the day. And then what you do is you just get more and more granular um, depending on what your needs are. So I mentioned the example of the fire trucks, right? So if you see fire trucks, uh, you know, we can say that the image was generally taken in the afternoon. If we can find a reliable piece of evidence that will tell us exactly when the fire trucks arrived, then we're getting more granular, right? So any picture, uh, you know, say that time was 3.15 in the afternoon, for some reason, we, we figure that out, then any image that shows uh, fire trucks at the east front must have been taken after 3.15. And so that's, and, and you get more and more and more, more granular using uh, contextual cues in the image until, uh, you know, ideally you have like a minute by minute reconstruction of like when each uh, video was taken. So that can be super time consuming. Uh, but that's what uh, that's what we do <laughs> telling Ken. All right, uh, Giancarlo, next question is from Fatma. She asks, uh, is this sheet, I believe she's referring to the capital, the open source, where where is that available on your website? Oh, so I don't think it's on our website. Um, it's on our Twitter account. I can uh, put it in the chat if you're interested in uh, seeing it. Um, we can yeah. uh, we can include maybe you no. Know, yeah, I'm trying to see if there's an actual chat here. Oh, OK, I'll send it to you, David, and then maybe. Yeah. You Maybe can, over the yeah. over the in between the break, Fatma, I'll post it uh, yeah. in the Q and A uh, window here where you post it. So thank you. Uh, and now uh, we have uh, Mick had uh, kind of two questions here. Uh, first question was, how did your journey with uh, with with Bellingcat begin? With with OSINT and, and Bellingcat begin, and specifically in terms of your technical skills and mindset, you need to start, and how has it changed since then? Sure. Yeah. Um, I started working with Bellingcat as a volunteer in 2018. Uh, Bellingcat was launched in 2014, and when Bellingcat launched, I watched it happen. Like I, I watched, uh, uh, you know, the, there was a crowdsourcing um, effort to to get financing for the website, and I was part of the internet community from which Bellingcat uh, sprung. And I thought that open source research was the coolest thing ever because you could, I saw how you could gain insight and how you could add to conversations that people were having about events that were taking place really far away. I'm originally from Venezuela. And so when I saw Bellingcat launch, I thought I can do something like that about Venezuela. At that moment in time in Venezuela, there was these protests, anti-government protests that were happening. They were huge. So I thought I can kind of do what Bellingcat is doing in terms of like open source research about Venezuela specifically. So I started a blog in 2014 doing open source research on Venezuela protests. Nobody read it. Uh, you know, like I was doing it religiously every day. It was a, it was a passion project for me. I, you know, it never really took off, but I developed open source research skills through doing this blog for four years. 2018, I started to volunteer with Bellingcat. They they knew that I had this website and they knew that I knew about Venezuela. Um, I had experience. They asked me to help them with a couple of Venezuela related projects. I was happy to do it. And then at the end of 2018, I was offered a position as the uh, uh, to work on Latin America specifically. So um, how have I changed since then? Well, I, I'd like to think I I know more now about open source research than I did before. One of the great things about Bellingcat is that uh, it's a community. And so we're constantly learning new things from each other and also from our readers and from people who, uh, you know, are, are occupy the same space that we do, the open source space. So. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm a, I am know much more about open source research now uh, than I did when I started. And I and I know there's lots more that I that I need to learn. So I'm looking forward to doing that. OK, so we have time for a few more questions, I think. So uh, I'm going to uh, just jump. Uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, Mick, Mick had two questions. I'm going to jump to uh, an anonymous poster here, which I think is is funny when you a little bit when you read his question, it kind of makes sense. He says, do you or your colleagues fear being targeted perhaps yeah. by cyber attacks for your role in uncovering wrongs, you know, by people, sometimes very powerful people? Yeah, so a lot of the research that we do involves, um, yeah, like the, the Russian state, like the GRU and the FSB. Uh, so oh. You muted yourself by mistake, uh, Giancarlo. 
Okay, that was weird. I did not. I thought that. that was the Russian state for a second. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. That's. Okay, I'm back now. Okay. So, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So we do uh, research on these on these folks, um, and so we have been targeted in the past by by what are called spear phishing attacks. So we are always on the lookout for. You know, anytime we get a suspicious email, you know, we talk about it, we discuss it because we're wondering is this is this part of uh, uh, one of these efforts. Um, we have in, uh, internal protocols for uh, digital safety that we're rigorous about. And yeah, I, I worry about, uh, you know, I think about it. As I said, if I ever get a suspicious email, if I didn't work at Bellingham, I'd just be like, okay, whatever, I'll just delete it. But when I get one, I think, is this more than just like a weird email? Um, but you know, I live in I live in Toronto. Thankfully, um, I'm you know physically I feel completely fine. But yeah, we're, we're always uh, sort of on the lookout for digital digital attacks. Thanks. And so uh, Mick had another uh, question, which I thought was really interesting, which was, um, how will your change as deep fake videos become more convincing and commonplace? Oh yeah, I actually just finished a video uh, on that for our Patreon uh, account on deep fake technology. The answer is, you know, can, can you can you imagine a deep fake that is a hundred percent indistinguishable from real life? In that case, well, yes, that could pose problems, right? Like if you have uh, digital material that is using deep fake technology that is completely undistinguishable from a real video of a real person, then that could pose a problem. We're not at that stage yet, but I will say that um, you don't need to have a hundred percent accurate deep fake videos to trick people into believing false things. Uh, the bar for this uh, and misinformation is incredibly low. Just think about uh, disinformation that spreads through text, right? You know, I, I you know, you'll get a message from from for, for me. It's always like relatives, right? Like they'll send me a message on WhatsApp saying, look, I just got this text message that President Maduro has fled and he's in Colombia and he's, you know, and it's not true, right? But people believe that anyways, right? Some people do. And so the the bar I think for for mis and disinformation is really low. I don't think we need to get to perfectly um, um, convincing deep fake technology for 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 dis and misinformation to be a problem. So I guess the question is, it could be a problem, but we it doesn't. I mean, we we already have problems without getting to that point. All right, thanks. And uh, so I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, Miha asks, uh, is the process of analyzing details or contextualizing the pictures like for the capital event entirely manual? Is there any technology being developed in this direction? Yeah, it's mostly manual. Um, there are tools that uh, like machine learning tools that can, for example, identify objects. Um, it works with faces as well, facial recognition. Um, but um, you know, you could have a, 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 a platform that identifies, for example, like a, a particular door in a in videos, for example, right? So you could tell, you could feed, you know, the entire database of materials to this um, network, and then it would, you know, pick out all of the ones that show the door that you're interested in. Um, you can also do that with faces. So there's, com you know, there's open source commercially available facial recognition technology um, that, uh, you know, you, anyone can access. You just go to a website and it's there and that can help you identify people in footage by showing you any other picture of them uh, online. So, you know, linking to like their SoundCloud profile picture or something like that. So there are tools that help do this. Um, I'm excited about where the technology is going. I'm particularly excited about the technology, anything that can help us identify objects and identify the same object across multiple videos. I think that's that's something that I'm really excited about. But for the most part, it's manual. We're still uh, at Bellingcat, we're still at the stage where we're, uh, you know, reviewing materials uh, by hand for the most part. And so our, our final question before we kind of take a quick break before Mara Pimenti comes up is um, Adil asks, so this is a little related, but do you use any AI machine learning or open source tools to reconstruct events, for example, using sound, speech, or image recognition? Yeah, so one of the things that we'll do is, for example. And also to share it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay, there's a, there's a, you know, uh, Microsoft has a platform, Microsoft Azure, 
has a has a video indexing platform and I think it's free to sign up for it and it will index like a certain amount of hours of footage. And what that means, so anyone could do this is yeah, you, uh, I don't have the URL, but if you like Google Microsoft Azure video indexer, I think is what it's called. You sign up for it, uh, you log in and then what you can do is you can feed it video. And so you just upload video to it. And what this uh, platform will do is that it will look, it will watch the videos and then it will pick out people. And it will say if you give it 10 videos, in theory what the platform is trying to do is it's trying to say, OK, this this person who appears in in the first video that you gave me, he's also in videos number four, six, seven and ten. And the platform will, will show you like where in the video. So if you have a live stream that's eight hours long, um, it will show you like, OK, the person that 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 um, you know, I'm, I'm picking out is in, you know, minute 315 and then he shows up at, you know, an hour and 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, so we've used that in the past and in fact, we've used it for this capital project. Um, and uh, that that makes up obviously the work of spotting individuals in different videos a lot easier because otherwise you're playing where's Waldo with, uh, you know, like the shaman guy from <laughs> from uh, the Capitol riot, the, the QAnon guy who was dressed like a shaman, I guess that's his name. Um, so yeah, so that's one that's one tool that we've used in the past, Microsoft Azure uh, video indexer. And as I said, it's open source. Anybody can log in and, and create an account. We have a paid account now, I think, that has uh, like a higher limit of footage uh, hours. But if you just have the free version, you can you can work with uh, uh, that as well. Great. Well, uh, Giancarlo, thanks a lot. Uh, for being here today, kicking this off right. Uh, so now I think we're gonna just take a uh, short break right now and uh, get queued up for the next panelist, Mara Pometti from, I from IBM. Uh, so uh, stay tuned and we'll be back in a few minutes. Great, thank you. <laughs> So next up, we have uh, Mara Pometti, who's a lead data strategist at uh, IBM. Uh, she uh, is a polymath sitting at the intersection of data science, data journalism design, and is pursuing a profession as a data strategist and aims to bring together strategy, design, and storytelling in the context of artificial intelligence. So uh, thanks, Mara. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you. OK, let's start sharing my screen. Hope you see my screen. Okay. Yep. Oh, sending, awesome. Sending that live, yeah. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, as David said, my name is Mara Pometti. Uh, I'm Italian. I live in London. And today I want to explore with you the intersection between data journalism and AI. In fact, I believe that this is a really crucial moment in time to have this kind of conversation. And so hopefully this presentation will be inspiring for you. I'm a data strategist at IBM and what data strategist means is that I define and design AI business solutions by uncovering and revealing overlooked insights into companies' data. And I do that by applying an editorial approach to AI practices. And that involves uh, running design thinking workshops specifically tailored on a data centric methodology that I developed in IBM. And of course, the topic of today's conversation, building and crafting data visual narratives that translate the algorithms into actionable knowledge and concrete business results. For this reason, I find myself at the intersection of the technical and the business realm, and I act a kind of a translator who bridges these two different worlds together through data stories. We talk a lot about data journalism in environments such as news media outlets, newsrooms, design, but uh, I'm interested in how we can apply data journalism actually to every industry, especially the ones where AI thrives. 
because today AI is so pervasive in our lives that especially the industry is in charge to develop AI solutions need to approach AI from a human perspective, a journalism perspective. And hopefully by doing that, we will be able to increase AI explainability and democratize AI. And this brings me to the first chapter of my story, how I grew a data storytelling culture in a tech firm as IBM in a team of data scientists. When I got the job at IBM, I was hired as data journalist because that's my background. And uh, I was really excited about the role because I knew very well that I wanted be, to be at the center where innovation is taking place uh, and where AI is shaking things up. But I didn't know, I mean, didn't have any clue about uh, what uh, my role would be in a team of data scientists. That team uh, is named Data Science and AI Elite, and basically is a client team that develop AI solutions. When I was uh, in the team, I met different colleagues who uh, uh, are coming from different backgrounds. Some of them are machine learning engineers, uh, are data engineers, others are optimization experts, others data scientists, uh, and others are dedicated to the business growth of the team. And then there was me, the only data journalist in this team of data scientists, uh, and uh, I didn't have any idea, any clue about how that team could use my skills in journalism in a, to help a client, uh, because overall I was coming from journalism, so I had in my mind a specific idea of what the story is, a data story, and I couldn't have any clue about uh, how to use the stories uh, um, for clients and industries. And especially my colleagues uh, didn't know anything about the data journalism and what a data journalist was about. And so uh, it happened that as soon as I got into the team, they started asking me for building whatever kind of charts and graphics and data visualization and dashboards and UI. Um, and yes, that was my face at the time because it was immediately clear to me that they had this misconception that the data visualization is the same things of data stories, but it's not. Data visualization is never the point. Data visualization is only a mean that we use to discover insights into the data and see what data tells us. But uh, eventually we want to communicate those insights. And if we don't use the stories, we will always fail to communicate the data and AI insights. I wanted my colleagues at that point to see the data as a raw material that they could shape as a tangled of intricate patterns and connections. And it's by understanding uh, those patterns and those connections uh, that connect the data that we can extract meaningful insights uh, and then build the stories. But to do that, uh, we always have to pass through context and research and understanding of how this web of data is made up. That idea was really clear in my mind, uh, but the problem was how to communicate it to my new colleagues. Of my story, so how I use data storytelling uh, or client engagement uh, um, to amplify AI use cases. The first uh, IBM client I worked with uh, is called James Fisherson. Um, which is a leader provider in oil, gas and marine services. And they approached my team because they needed to develop a, a predictive maintenance system because they wanted to locate and identify the failures occurring on the high voltage cables, the wind farm assets. It was pretty clear. And it happened that the data scientists I was working with, they immediately jumped on the data and they started building their machine learning models to show the client the predictions. And what eventually they presented to the client during the first sprint was something that looked like an hodgepodge of screenshots taken from their Jupyter notebooks 
And actually, even if they called it story, it, it was not a story. It wasn't a story because what they showed to the client was just a, a separate answer inside. So there was no context whatsoever. Um, it was full, the presentation was full of jargon and technical detail, too technical for the people presented in the room. And it was kind of having a not articulated speech. The client, Jim Tisher, could understand the general sense of what we were doing with uh, their data. But the problem was that that knowledge, how it was communicated, wasn't enough to do it, to take it and do something with it, to take action based on that knowledge. What if I tell you that from here now, I'm gonna talk to you in Egyptian hieroglyphics. How would you feel about that? Would be pretty confusing, right? And that was the exact feeling of James Fisher in the room. We were sharing the same context. They were not data scientists. And it was kind of, we were talking two different languages. We needed stories to communicate. In fact, we had a big gap between how the algorithms were presented and the human understanding of the people in the room that basically were business people. And I believe that was that crack in the process that allowed me to propose my colleagues to start the approaching um, the use case from a totally different perspective, from an editorial perspective. And what I did was to run a design thinking workshop to understand at least conceptually the information the client wished to had access to. And then from there, I interviewed some stakeholders and I skimmed through my interviews the same way I would do in journalism to highlight the key information that should be part of the story. I then defined my storyline and that led me to do the first sketches of how the data narrative could look like. And as last step, I developed the interactive data narrative. And it was by working on this process on the smaller story by applying an editorial approach that eventually I discovered a much bigger story. Because James Fisher was keeping asking us for a predictive maintenance tool, but actually what they really needed was a much larger solution. And it wasn't until they saw their data coming to life in a consistent and cohesive data narrative that they understood that what they really needed was to connect the technical aspect of their maintenance system to the business aspect. By visualizing how much money they could save by leveraging the outputs of the machine learning, so the predictions regarding the failures, they understood that uh, this data narrative was showing them actually more than that. It was for them an AI strategy because it illuminated all the opportunities hidden in James Fisher data and how these opportunities could be leveraged by AI models, by connecting predictive models, so machine learning output with prescriptive models, so all the optimization models. And it was by seeing that that they understood that this model could be applied also to other subsidiaries that they own, not just the wind farm assets. What we managed to do with my colleagues, it was really to translate the knowledge regarding the models uh, and data science process uh, locked in their Jupyter notebooks into a compelling visual story. And at that point, they under, my, my colleagues understood very well that the stories uh, are important, uh, not just in journalism or in the media industry, but also in data science and especially in the tech industry. But for doing that, we always have to follow a specific story arch, which starts with what? What we need to do? What needs to get done? what defines the scope of the project and of the story. And then we are all obsessed with how, how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna implement those, how it defines the process that we're going to follow and the actions we're gonna perform. But what if I tell you that there are even two more important things than what and how? And first it's context, because it's not just the data by itself, but it's 
how um, what the data says to us and how it relates to the facts and events surrounding the data. And then we have why. Why is the most important question that we can ask ourselves even with data and AI? Because uh, this word means everything and oftentimes because we are so skillful and so smart we skip through this word these three letters that are really the reason why the story gets written once this process was clear there was another step that uh, i tried to communicate to my colleagues which is the format of the data in fact aesthetics helps trigger curiosity and uh, helps people approaching the data and engaging with the data in a more human um, way. Um, in fact, the unusual visualization always triggers curiosity and make people explore, be willing to explore the data even more because they are attracted from unusual and beautiful uh, visualization. So the format is really crucial, especially today when trust in AI is kept being eroded. So we need a way to engage people in understanding the data that are the results of AI models. Because eventually, if we really want to unleash uh, all the power of AI, all the AI uh, potential, we have always to connect AI to our human conversation. Because uh, at the end, uh, we communicate AI to people. And to do that, we have to engage with people through emotions. Because we, as human beings, we are emotion decision makers. And what we want to do with data stories, it's really to stimulate our emotional intelligence by connecting it to our analytical intelligence that drives the decisions. In fact, that for this particular reason, also Gartner, in one of its latest reports, says that by 2025, data stories will be the most widespread way of communicating data analytics. And that leads me to the third and last chapter of my story. So how now I'm using uh, data storytelling uh, in internal teams in IBM. Because in June, I had the opportunity to switch team. So from a client-based phase team, I am now part of the chief data office team. And the chief data office mission, it's really to uh, leverage data, the value of um, enterprise data assets in order to generate business value out uh, of um, uh, this data through AI. And besides these very business and technical um, uh, activities, the chief data officer is also responsible for building a new culture regarding related to data um, and data literacy and uh, try to communicate a new vision around what we can do with data and how we communicate with data. And for this reason, you can get, as you can guess, uh, all these elements are connected and supported by data storytelling because oftentimes the chief data officer has to communicate uh, innovative and also challenging AI and analytics idea to key business stakeholders internally at the, at the company. And for this reason, I started uh, um, a few experimental projects in my team, uh, one of which uh, um, was to publish uh, um, bi-weekly newsletter. And so far, so good. The idea but was that uh, um, I was keeping wondering how to incorporate a data um, storytelling approach into the traditional format of a newsletter. And the answer actually um, came uh, while uh, I was uh, trying to understand how give people uh, in the company new ideas to communicate uh, with AI and machine learning. And so I started to build uh, um, an NLP algorithms to get more data um, out of all the stories that I was going to, uh, to, to write and publish. And I parse every each story through this algorithm to get new data regarding the keywords used, the sentiment of these words, the attributes regarding uh, and linked to the keywords uh, and other many type of data. 
Um, and I created this every time for every newsletter issue, um, very unusual and experimental um, data story to really try to highlight the stories behind the text and the words that the people couldn't grasp, couldn't see. And I wanted this to be very an experimental project to really try to spur new ideas inside IBM of how we can use machine learning data and how we can use AI models to really communicate in another way that is more, um, as I said before, human approachable. And for this uh, uh, reason, uh, I started at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, a new project. Um, um, that I call the Crino, um, which is a platform uh, um, where to share stories built upon AI. Um, it happened that a lot of my friends and data scientists were working on machine learning models to predict uh, the number of infected cases, and I wanted people to benefit from those results. I wanted a broad array of people um, who are not technical experts uh, who maybe don't have the knowledge of really understand AI and cope with the uncertainty that it's always included in the models. And so I created this platform that was really um, bold and with a fresh look because I wanted people um, to engage in the most easiest way um, with uh, AI models. Because eventually I really believe that uh, if we want to communicate AI, we need to facilitate understanding of people. And data stories are the perfect mean to do that because stories help us uh, to understand the complex ideas. Uh, story can be shared, the story can be told. Stories, in my opinion, overcome barriers. Uh, and build the bridges between experts and domains that uh, otherwise wouldn't be connected. And I believe that it's uh, uh, for this reason that at some point in my journey, I stopped uh, being and feeling as the only separate data journalist in my team. And I became very aware of the mission that I can serve in uh, the context of uh, data science and AI with my own skills. And that mission is to make AI more understandable. And uh, with that, I try to make AI a little bit more pop, more popular, because uh, I feel that if we can increase AI explainabilities and really make AI explainable to everyone, eventually we will increase also trust in AI and especially fairness, which today we need more than anything. Thank you. Thanks, Mara. So uh, once again, I'd, I'd like to you know, open the floor to invite anyone who has any questions to please uh, submit uh, just on the uh, side through Microsoft Teams. And I'm sure Mara is happy to answer any questions. I have a question. So how much uh, how much uh, do you do on your own time of, of learning and, and what languages or programming languages are you uh, interested in learning or like for example like Python libraries or things like that? Yeah, uh, Python libraries for sure. <laughs> it's uh, um, mandatory. Um, we use it uh, um, basically every day, I would say, um, especially when I was engaged with client team um, because uh, it's the main language for data scientists uh, to be a uh, model. Um, so um, yeah. That's for sure, um, and I'm always interested in learning uh, um, new languages for data visualization, even though I'm really switching a lot uh, um, toward uh, um, the machine learning world. Uh, I'm, I've been learning a lot from my colleagues and I'm super fascinated by machine learning, so I'm switching toward that direction. Thanks, and uh, Adil has a question. He says, it looks like data storytelling in tech companies is a new thing and there are little open positions right now. What can you suggest to data and visual journalists who want to work as data strategists, storytellers uh, in larger companies like IBM, Google, or Microsoft, et cetera? 
<laughs> just to apply because we are super in need of these skills. Uh, um, it wasn't until, uh, I believe, recently that tech companies uh, started to understand that uh, data journalism, I mean, data journalists uh, are not roles uh, just linked to the media um, industry, but they are benefiting a lot uh, in many ways, more than what I just showed you in this. 20 minutes uh, because also internally if you think of the design teams for example all the world of the ux research uh, doing data storytelling like in teams like that also it's a big thing uh, but also in research uh, um, in client with clients so there are a lot of opportunities uh, um, and um, people in tech uh, do not have uh, those kind of people uh, those, those kind of skills uh, the roles um, because they have been hired uh, um, totally uh, different experts for so many years uh, and now they are in sick of it. So um, they really need it. Thanks and, and Fatma asks, she's wondering if you had another example or any examples of using uh, AI in storytelling specifically. Yes, um, a lot. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, many of them uh, are just uh, client uh, stories, uh, and so uh, I can't uh, share those stories, but uh, I've done a lot of them, um, sometimes uh, through graphics, in, uh, motion graphics, uh, uh, sometimes with interactive scroll telling. Um, unfortunately, the data uh, can be shared, so um, that's why I pick uh, the public references example um, that I could show you. Great. Well, um, thanks a lot, Mara. I think. Oh, Thank we you. have one more. We have another question. Uh, is there any published materials from her from her side that you can see? Is there any any I guess anything public facing right now or? Uh, that yeah. was a question from Lillian, yeah. Yeah, I have everything Where? on my website and some links uh, um, in IBM, uh, in the IBM website, so I can share with you guys, uh, with you, David, uh, and so you can share in the chat maybe during the break. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Also, I believe you're, I have a profile view up on the website, I think with a link to your website as well. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, Another question uh, is um, from Marcelito we have is, what has been the most effective formats to communicate complex data sets for to people of other professional areas to understand, understand besides infographics? Yeah, formats, I would say video. Um, as I mentioned, uh, um, motion graphics uh, a lot, uh, because what happened is that usually we present uh, um, these discoveries, uh, um, the AI outcomes, uh, um, in large room of people during uh, a print review. And what happened is that the most compelling and engaging way, at least uh, what I found uh, um, with my experience, is really um, videos. And because everyone engaged, uh, uh, it's not uh, something like a link, an interactive story that you see and visualize by yourself. Uh, um, so it's something that uh, from a communication uh, perspective, it's really impactful. Um, so that's my favorite. Great, thanks. And we have someone here asking, um, is there any specific differences between a, a data journalist with and a content writer in, in that in the industry in that they both focus on stories? Um, yeah, not a big difference in the sense that eventually, um, at least in my, my own case, uh, you do both. Um, and especially when uh, people from the tech side uh, hire data journalists, they also expect uh, um, you writing stories because they maybe have this idea that the digital journalist is just the one writing and publishing stories using data. Um, so it's really up to us, our roles, I guess, uh, to show them that it's not just the writing stories. It's more than that. It's also um, creating new content. Um, so there is a part of content strategies and um, making data, I mean, using every format to make data more um, uh, approachable. Great, thanks. And we have one more question, which I think I'll, um, 
I can also help maybe answer this too. Uh, someone asked them if, uh, where does one learn the basics of, of data journalism? Uh, if you're a journalism student, but data journalism isn't being taught in your particular program. So I'll, I'll just start off and then I'm interested to hear maybe where, where you might have learned it, Mara, but I, I can say that um, if you're a data journalism student uh, and it's not being taught uh, there, you can try a lot of data journalism teams uh, around the world kind of publish their material. And, and there's also a lot of uh, nonprofits. I would say datajournalism.com is a good one to go check out. They're, they're hosted by the European Journalism Center. Uh, the Google News Initiative has a lot of different tutorials and, and tools, uh, as well as I believe the New York Times has a series of learning kind of learning materials for, for onboarding new data journalists. And in Canada, uh, for example, the Globe and Mail uh, shout out to Tom Cardoso, who'll be speaking uh, later on during this conference, has their, I guess, uh, beginner R libraries, if you're interested in that. So it, it's good to kind of check around. There are a lot of uh, free resources out there. Eventually, uh, we'll have more up on the StoryLab website if you want to check back uh, in a little bit after the conference. But uh, I'm interested, yeah, Mara, to hear uh, where, where you got your start. Yeah, um, yeah. Besides all the tools and channels that you mentioned, David, uh, um, my I started actually with colleagues. Uh, um, they were the most uh, um, important resource for me to start it. Uh, I started my career in a data-driven design agency called Accurat, um, and so really um, I started there to understand from the developers working there. And and then, of course, uh, using uh, other channels and uh, GitHub repositories a lot. Uh, um, and then eventually I won a scholarship at the University of Southern California and for a program in data journalism. And of course, there I, I picked a lot uh, um, of skills. But uh, my most important resources are have always been colleagues, uh, I have to say. Thanks, Maria. And I'd also uh, like to add, someone just reminded me, and I can't believe I, I didn't remember this. Um, IRE, the Investigative Reporters and Editors for Students, uh, which you can find on IRE.org. Uh, they also have a lot of student right. resources as well. Yes. A big one. Through. Yeah, so sign up for that. <laughs> sign up for IRE. Be an IRE member. Uh, it's great. Lots of data sets and, and, and things there available for you. Um, yeah, so I think that brings us to uh, the conclusion here, Mara. Thanks so much. Thank uh, you. For your time, yeah, and uh, and that was great. And we'll be uh, back shortly uh, with Jane Litvinenko from BuzzFeed. Good luck. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Hi, and welcome back, everyone. We're here now with Jane Litvinenko from BuzzFeed, who only gave me a minor heart attack, but that's fine. Uh, Jane is, as I read her bio, I know her, I, I should know this off the heart, but uh, she's a senior reporter at BuzzFeed where she focuses on disinformation and online investigations. And her work is focused on the rise of conspiracy theories, hyperpartisan news and cryptocurrency scams and extremism globally, among others. I also know she is an avid lover of dogs. Welcome, Jane. Hi, thank you for having me. Sorry for giving you a heart attack. Um, I blame Microsoft as ever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So uh, yeah, why don't we get Jane and I take it away? Sure, yeah. Hi, so um, I'm Jane. I'm a senior reporter at BuzzFeed. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about useful things to show, I was thinking about probably the most used tool in my arsenal, which is just creative Googling, creative searching, um, using Boolean searches to um, figure out essentially uh, what it is we're looking for or find find new things, do live monitoring. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, we're all OK. Everybody can see everything. Just shout if you can't. Otherwise, I'll assume agreement, um, just like I'll assume laughter at my jokes, um, even if I don't hear it. Um, so what we're going to cover is Boolean searches with Google and Twitter, um, combining terms and narrowing down searches, thinking through generating key terms, sort of really getting into the mindset of how do I talk to the computer. And if you'd like to follow along or have this presentation for yourself, um, you're welcome to it. Here's the short 
uh, bit.ly URL where you can download it. It should be bit.ly uh, slash data driven searching. So when we talk about search usage, the uh, most imperious, uh, the most important thing to think about is how do different users experience uh, the web? What would a person involved in disaster post? Or how would a bad actor uh, post their message? Those are very different examples and would use very different types of language. Um, and as we go through uh, um, what I have to show you today, but also in your day to day work, be aware that digital manipulation of journalism is very widespread. So that means there are real attempts to manipulate you. And if you find a document online, whether that's um, on Twitter, on Google, through any of the means that I show you, do your best to verify the document, make sure that it's correct before reporting on it. Um, and finally, always be open to your audience. Um, talk to people in the community. Uh, one of the best ways to learn um, any of this stuff really is through conversation and figuring out what other people are doing. And at the end of this presentation, I will also have some resources for you on how to expand um, the skill set, the basics of which I will teach you right now. So what to think about when thinking through keywords or key terms that we're searching for? Um, think through places, and if that includes places as they are said by people. So include abbreviations, nicknames, airport codes, um, key neighborhoods, streets, or maybe famous structures, um, famous structures in that city or in that region. Um, include alternate spellings, translations, um, autocorrect errors, if that will be helpful to you in your search. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, my, my amount of typos that I make on the internet is just like extremely high. Um, so think through some typos that people could make when you're doing searches. If you're looking for events, name the event, include the hashtags like hashtags of support or even hashtags um, of opposition. Look at synonyms for terms that are associated with the event. Um, include names and titles for any officials or community groups or organizers and activists. And this is particularly true with social media searching rather than um, rather than Google or uh, other search engine uh, usage. With social media and Twitter specifically, including names of community groups um, and key political figures can be very very helpful. Um, and then you should think through more generic terms, more general um, lingo that could be used when you're um, when you're doing your searches. And I'll show you a little bit of what this looks like in practice, but it's really important to get this foundation going. So think through words like activists, arrest, authorities, police, ambulance, hospital. Um, breaking is a great, great key term to search for if you're looking for breaking news. Um, conference or press conference can also be very, very handy. Um, the, any hashtags, the words live or live stream will turn up a lot of videos, um, especially on Twitter, um, but also on Facebook and on YouTube. So think through sort of the language around the search term to see, OK, if a person is tweeting this, what is the language they would be using? Would they be talking about the police? Would they be talking about um, ambulances or hospitals or fundraisers? Fundraisers are a great um, way to find sources. So um, there is a whole world of Boolean search operators, and I'm going to give you a resource that you can refer to again and again. I'm going to walk you guys through the basic ones. So if you're searching on Twitter, the until and since uh, search operator are really, really helpful. So for that, you can use the date parameters 
of your search. For example, if you're looking for posts around January 6th, um, I don't know why you would, but just in case the mood strikes, January 6th might, might have been um, a date that you want to look at. Um, you can uh, say since 2021-01-05 and until 2021-01-07 and you will get um, you will get results from that date. The other useful key terms to keep in mind here are or, and, minus sign, brackets, and quotes. Just keep those, um, keep those in, uh, in your brain um, and I will show you how they work in practice in a second. So when you're constructing a monitoring search, it's really helpful to think algebraically. Think of it like putting together an equation or a math, a math equation. Separate out the locations, names, key terms, and put like with like. So for a location, put that in its own separate set of brackets. Um, what brackets do is they essentially limit the, the search to what is within the brackets. So for location, I put Philly, Philadelphia, PHL, which is the airport code, Pennsylvania, or PA, which is the abbreviation for the state. And the reason I use the word or instead of and is because it tells the computer that it can use any of these terms to search for. Um, the word or, so you can think of it as a comma, um, as, a, as a comma in a list. You can search for any of these terms. Um, likewise, would the name include people's honorifics um, or any sort of common abbreviations for that in honorifics? The common abbreviations are really important to remember to include because very frequently people, um, especially on Twitter, will try to get within the character count by abbreviating um, names or honorifics or anything like that. So you really want to make sure those are included um, in your search. Um, and then um, key terms, uh, you can just go wild here. Um, use a, any amount of key terms that you like. Um, so here, for example, um, the way that I combined this search is I was looking for, uh, if I were looking for um, voter fraud or uh, uh, allegations of fraud in Philly or Pennsylvania, I would essentially put the first brackets where it says location and say, um, put the word and in between them and then put the term, the key terms, fraud, fraudulent, cheat, illegal, steal, rigged, harvesting, corrupt, suppression, anything else that you want in there. And then finally, um, I really want to highlight the usefulness of the words me, my, myself, I, or I'm. Um, this is especially helpful during breaking news situations if there is an environmental disaster or an attack or another type of event where a person might be speaking, um, speaking for themselves. Um, so, um, so this search, me, my, myself, I, I'm, it can be really helpful in combination with key terms. For example, um, if you're looking for victims of a hurricane, they're not going to be saying um, an official, like officials send help here. They're going to be saying, I need help. Um, so uh, once again, putting yourself into the person's shoes when you're monitoring social media and thinking, how would I tweet or how would they tweet in that situation? That is um, a really, really key to um, a very good search. So um, an example of a Twitter search, if you like, you can try it yourself with this uh, bit.ly URL. Unfortunately, we don't have the whole lot of time, so I'll talk you through the demo. Um, but um, there are a couple of mistakes that I've deliberately made in this search. Um, in this case, I was looking for any instances of people um, who were talking about the second pandemic movie. I already knew um, the two URLs and I knew that it was going to be called indoctrination. So here's um, so first of all, let's look at the mistakes that I've made here. 
first uh, is that the second or uh, you can see is lowercase. In order for a Boolean search to work, these operators or and and have to be all uppercase. So if you wanted to for this search to work, you would need to put that or in uppercase. And the second mistake is a spelling mistake. Um, I put that in there just as a reminder that this could be um, this could be one of the way one of the reasons why your search doesn't work. If you can see the second URL just says readem instead of freedom.tv. So make sure when you're pasting URLs, when you're monitoring URLs, you're keeping in mind um, you're keeping in mind the spelling and making sure that everything's correct. And here's where we can see the great use of the AND search operator. So the second pandemic movie was called Indoctrination. Terrible pun. Um, they tried, they really tried, but terrible pun. Um, and the reason why I put the word and there is because I wanted to make sure that I was only getting the second version of the pandemic movie, which is pandemic and indoctrination, which means we are searching for both of those terms together as opposed to the or where the terms are interchangeable. Um, there are also really useful search operators for um, Google, uh, which is the primary search engine that um, I think most online investigators go to, um, but I'll walk you guys through some other search engines in a moment. Um, the ones that I want to highlight um, and the ones that I will show you are site, in URL and file type. Um, if you'd like to get the full list of search operators, um, just hit uh, or just go to this bit.ly URL now. Um, it will pop up a really, really handy list that I use and refer to all the time. I'm going to give you guys Give you guys a second to do that. Uh, make sure you do that. Um, but uh, um, all right. So, how do these search operators work? The site search operator allows you to search for a particular website. The file type operator allows you to search for a particular type of document, whether it's an XLS, a JPEG, a .doc, um, a PDF, a PowerPoint, which is PPT, um, and that, that can be really, really useful. So all of these searches, I really encourage you guys to just go ahead and try them yourself as I'm talking you through them. Um, it's really important to practice these things and to see how they how they work. So in the first example, um, I'm looking for any annual reports from FEMA, which is the governmental um, agency in the US responsible for disaster relief that have the word flood in them. Um, this, uh, and I'm looking for PDFs specifically because I want the full report. Um, I just want to see what documents are available on the FEMA website. Now, you could, in theory, go to the FEMA website yourself and type in annual report and flood into their search engine, but this way you will get essentially everything that Google has indexed. Um, it's a much more efficient way to search, um, and you can do this with any government website, any corporate, really any website that you suspect would hold, would host a PDF file. With the second search, what I wanted to show you here is um, we can actually include parts of a URL while we are searching. So rather on searching Facebook only, I wanted to search the groups portion of Facebook. So in this case, uh, the way that the Facebook URL structure works is you're able is, uh, uh, excuse me, when you go to a group, um, you'll see that the Facebook URL is facebook.com slash groups slash whatever the group number is. So let's use that. If you type in site 
uh, colon facebook.com forward slash groups and um, stop the steal. And I put this in quotation marks to make sure that I get very relevant results. You will actually get a list um, of uh, a few dozen Facebook groups that um, are under the stop the steal moniker. And using this technique, we were able to write a story showing that stop the steal groups on Facebook were still proliferating despite the fact that Facebook has in the past banned these groups. Now if you do the search now you will see a lot of the caches of the Facebook groups um, but if you um, actually click on the links um, all of them will be removed but you will still be able to see the group names and the fact that they've existed which might still be helpful in your research. The third example is where we're using search operators in URL and in text. In URL means the URL that you're searching for will include this word. In text means somewhere on the website, this word will, um, will appear. Um, in this example, we're saying give me the word resume either in URL or on the website for the name John Doe. Um, and here is where you can really narrow it down um, and say in Austin and in Texas. And if you do this search yourself, you should be able to um, see a template from the University of Texas for a resume for a John Doe. This is a really great way to research your sources and understand what they've done in the past, maybe get their phone number or their email that's not publicly listed. Um, it's a very, very handy thing to have in your back pocket. Um, the other thing I'll say for in URL is if you have a username uh, for somebody um, on one social media network, you can use in URL to find that username on other social media networks because on most social media networks, the username appears in the profile, in the URL that the person um, uh, sorry, in the URL associated with the person's profile. It's very difficult to talk through um, algebra, uh, word algebra. So if, for example, you wanted to test this out, you can say put in in URL and a username of yourself or a friend or somebody you're researching and just try that. Um, realize we're, we're uh, halfway through here, um, but two more um, search combinations that I really wanted to show you guys. And again, I really hope that you're doing this as I am talking about it. No substitute, um, no substitute for uh, doing things in practice. Um, you can use the wildcard or the asterisk um, search operator in uh, URLs to search for something. So during a breaking news situation, if you are covering a new area, for example, and really want to find sources who are talking about this very, very quickly, um, this uh, a Twitter search is a really handy thing to have in your back pocket. So let's break it down a little bit. What are we searching for here? We're searching for a website, twitter.com, um, where in the middle will be essentially um, a wild card. We don't know what we want to put there. Google can figure out what goes there, but we do know that we want it to be limited to lists. This is how Twitter structures its website, and the wild card essentially says, Google, you can do what you want here, but everything else has to be as, as, I, um, as I have specified. And then we can include key terms that would be useful to us in that moment. So if it's the name of a city like Portland um, or the name of a sphere like politics, um, you can almost always find uh, lists that Twitter users have put together um, of handful sources or resources that they monitor. And that way you can have a running start during a breaking news situation um, for, uh, for people to turn to, people who would know what's going on. 
Um, finally, um, I would really like to turn your attention to Amazon buckets. Um, Amazon buckets are essentially a URL structure for websites that are hosted on the Amazon uh, web service, AWS. Um, sometimes you're able to find documents through uh, through those buckets. So I want you to take this last search, um, Amazon, uh, the s3.amazonaws.com, put in the file type PDS, PDF, excuse me, and include something like report or annual report. And then um, something that uh, I thought was interesting was you can type in general terms like Georgia and voter fraud and find the Secretary of State's report um, on voter fraud in Georgia. Um, there are vast applications for this. Um, be mindful of how you use it. Use it for good. Um, and um, and uh, it is also a variation of the very first search that I showed you, the FEMA search. So it's very similar to essentially um, looking across websites that are hosted on Amazon for things that might be helpful to us. Um, deleted content is not always uh, easy to find, so here are some um, great resources for you. The Go Back in Time Chrome extension, cannot say enough about it. Archive.is and archive.org are really great resources as well. On uh, For Twitter, you can use Threader app and PolitiTweet. You can also just search the actual URL in Google and see if a cache comes up. Um, and you can search this. This one's the, the 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 least reliable and trickiest one. You can search replies on Twitter uh, with an image for a screenshot, but there could be fakes there. It's a really not surefire thing. Go through the first five steps first. Other two tools that can help with Twitter are Follow.me, TweetBeaver, FollowerWonk. Um, all of these, uh, I'll give you the presentation link at the end uh, as well, so you can get all of these together. Um, finally, if you're doing image searches, not all um, not all search engines are created equal. Um, different search engines are good for different things, so try them across the board. Um, and for video search, I highly recommend the Invid vVerify search extension. You can download it at bit.ly.com video.ext. Um, there are tutorials there as well. Um, I just want to make sure we have lots of time for questions afterwards. So final notes is keep a cheat sheet and a list of useful past searches you can turn to. I have a note in my notes app that's literally just all of the Boolean searches that I do that I can uh, very quickly adapt to the situation. Make sure to arch archive content um, as you need it. If you create an account on archive.org, it will give you a list of everything you've ever archived. It's really, really handy. It's free. Cannot recommend it enough. Archive.org, shout out, one of the best internet organizations there is. Um, and you can actually archive the searches themselves. So if you, um, if you search something on Twitter or on Google and um, and you think, oh, the results to this are actually very useful, you can archive the results of that. Um, just drop the URL into archive.org. Um, think creatively, get into the habit of using this, put yourself into the poster's shoes. And that was really just the the basics of um, online searches. If you really want to get your hands dirty, these are three resources that I cannot recommend enough. The third version of the verification handbook was edited by, by my colleague Craig Silverman, contributed to by a lot of brilliant minds. The OSINT Curious Project, um, extremely helpful. Uh, blog posts, um, they hold a, um, a uh, podcast and a video cast on a regular basis, a really great way to sharpen your techniques. And the holy Bible of open source intelligence research is the open source Intel technique textbook. It's pricey, it's hefty, it is 100% worth your time. 
So that's it. If you have questions, uh, you can find me on Twitter or at my email listed here. Um, if you need the slides, here they are again. Make sure you grab them. Um, and other than that, I think we have five minutes left for questions. Let me just. Um, yeah, and we can. Uh, we we can also uh, we we can also extend it a bit depending on your timing because we have our lunch break coming up. Uh, but so I'll first, should someone just asked about putting the Bitly URL. You just kind of put that up there, but I can uh, reply in the thing so everyone can see it. What was that Bitly? Bitly yeah, URL? one second. Let me drop it in. I see some people are already here. Hello, everybody. Oh, um, at the end, at the end, there's also a slide, a bonus slide on how to copy Twitter lists that you found. Um, it takes a little bit to go through, but I thought I'd include that for you guys as a bonus. Oh, wow, that is um, formatting on that is a little strange, but OK, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the URL there. OK, where did you where did you plop that? I'll see where you. That's a good question. Uh, chat, meeting chat? There. Meeting yeah. chat. Yeah. Meeting chat. Okay, I'll, I'll put that. I'll put that as you're answering another question. I'll plop that in for everyone into the uh, the Q and A. Uh, someone, someone, uh, Maggie asked. Uh, misinformation has exploded online. Have you seen any particularly encouraging systematic attempts to thwart it? Um, <laughs> the deep sigh was because um, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is not really, but there are some encouraging attempts. The long answer is um, there's no silver bullet solution. So, um, so the resolution to misinformation online will involve a lot of civic engagement. It will involve social media platforms um, changing the way that their social media platforms work. Um, so um, I would say that we've started to slowly chip away at the problem, um, but slowly and chip away being the operative words here. Thanks. And uh, James Woods first says, not a question, but just want to say thanks. You're uh, welcome. For, for all the help. And then he actually did have a question. He said, do you have much experience digging through federal or provincial websites in Canada for specific documents or any tips on best practices for trying to find documents on government websites? So um, I focus primarily on the US, so I don't have um, as handy of a uh, skill set for you on uh, Canadian government documents, but that Boolean search that I gave, it, Boolean search example with FEMA that I gave you sh would work on Canadian or any other government websites. So give that a try and see where that takes you. Great. And uh, next question was uh, for location, is there an alternative way uh, to search on current locations such as Google near me? And some people, I think, answered or tried to answer in the in the chat. They said to do the near me thing, you can use the syntax on Twitter near London within uh, radius. I mean, maybe you could speak a little bit about doing those kinds of searches. Yeah, I would discourage doing location searches because it requires for people to explicitly um, allow Twitter to monitor its location and most people don't anymore. There isn't really an equivalent of on Google. Um, if you do want to look at what's going on at a specific location, I would turn to Snap Map which is open and free and you can just find the location you're looking at and look at what videos are being uploaded there. Um, alternatively, I would encourage you to look at the location on um, Instagram uh, where people do tend to tag their location a lot more. But for Twitter and Google, I would discourage uh, I would discourage location usage. Great, and uh, we had a question. Is there a way to do a Boolean expression to pull from RSS feeds and capture particular keywords using a search string? Not one that I know off the top of my head, but if you email me, I can try to find you one. Okay. And uh, someone else also asked, I want to search a business that is in close proximity that is cited as a legit business. How would you build the Boolean expression? I assume they're saying close proximity to them. 
Violent. Yeah, I would think uh, it depends on what you're searching uh, for. Um, I would look for what type of business it is and the location. Use those as key terms. Um, so would they list like the city um, or maybe list the neighborhood that they're in? Um, that can be helpful. Um, searching for any go goods or services that they might sell, um, that could be helpful. Or you could go about it in a roundabout way where um, if you know people who work there, you can look at their social media channels and see if you can narrow down uh, where uh, the name of the business that you could be looking for. Wait, and we just had someone ask him. I'm trying, like, I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to give succinct but informative answers. I hope it's That's working. Fire. OK, how do you approach researching subjects or documents in other la in languages you're not fluent in? Lots and lots of Google Translate or? Yeah, definitely Google Translate. Um, you can also change to uh, VPN, uh, VPN um, yourself to a different location, which will sometimes give you different results. Um, on Google, on the issues of Google Translate, which are myriad, um, something you can do is find news articles about what you're searching for in that language and then use the terminology from the news articles to search. Um, but honestly, the best thing is to just ask a friend. Um, it's uh, it's a lot easier than trying to guess. Um, it's, it is tricky to search in other languages. And I just had someone uh, ask, let me see if I can parse this out. There are a lot of fake businesses listed on Google Places, so a way to verify a cited site that is confirmed and how to find this in Boolean expression. I think that's the question. So, can you read it again, sorry? There's a lot of fake businesses listed on Google Places, so is mm -hmm. there a way to verify a cited a, a, a place that is confirmed and, and how to find this in Boolean expression. Like how do you how do you suss out a fake place, I guess? Yeah, okay. So there's a few things you can do here and you don't necessarily need Boolean expressions to do them. One, read um, read the reviews and click on the name of the reviewer to see if they've reviewed other businesses in that neighborhood. Um, two, see if an equivalent of that business exists on um, Instagram first, uh, but also maybe um, Twitter and Facebook. Um, and three, see if it's a registered business in the area that you're searching. Um, you can go to government websites and search for the name of the business. And uh, if it comes up, then you're good. Great. And uh, Jimmy Thompson, who's the uh, Story Lab Data Journals and Creative Recipient. Uh, also the editor of Capital, uh, Capital Daily News Online and uh, presenter, our keynote speaker for tomorrow, says, thank you, Jane. And he's, his mind is already blown. So <laughs> see, even people that are presenting can learn things too. So that's great. Fantastic. Um, if I can do a quick plug. Uh, we, uh, me and my colleague Craig Sillerman are doing a master class through uh, the investigative reporters and editors um, organization on February 19th. That is a day long master class. It's 35 bucks for members. So if you want to get your hands dirty and get more in depth, um, that would be the class for you. So that's IRE's doing it. I'm just going to, as, as you're talking, because I know I'm going to get a bunch of questions about where can I find that link? I'm going to see if I can yes. just pull up the. Uh, yeah, yeah we can post it right there in the chat for you. It's a boot camp, you said? It's a boot uh, It's yeah, a master class. I can uh, I can see if I can pull it up quickly here. Sure. Too. If you want to see if you can pull it up, that'd be great. I'm just looking. Okay, it's not yes. a boot camp. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. If you haven't visited IRE.org, I recommend it. Uh, that's a, another great place as well. Okay, got it. Here well, we go. Got it. You got put it. it in the chat. I'll put it in, in here. Do you see it? I don't know. Do I see it? Meeting uh, chat? I don't see it. If you put it in the meeting chat, I, I'll see it. Give me one sec here. Okay. Oh, yes, I got it. Okay. This Great. is coming now to the QA, and I'll leave it up for anyone. Who Great. Wants to and see that it. class has limited seats. So if you're interested, um, sign up sooner rather than later. Okay. I am just going to do that right now. Jane's Masterclass. Yeah, I took your online. She had a she did a, a night was part of a night online class, which uh, which is really good. Night felt night 
my foundation. Thank yeah. you. You got, you got it. <laughs> OK, so there I just posted the link for everyone. It is there. Also, um, Mick says, thanks so much, Jane, watching all the way from Singapore. Oh, hello. Wow, from Singapore. Ah, oh, amazing. All right. Well, I guess uh, I think that about rounds it up for questions. Uh, you can find Jane active and curmudgeonly on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thanks so much, Jane. And I guess this concludes the morning portion for the uh, for for data driven uh, 2021 day one. We'll be resuming again at as I have to remind myself of our own schedule. We'll be we'll be resuming at 1 p.m. Eastern with Surya Matu from uh, who's he's our keynote for today for day one. He's from the markup. And he's going to tell you the true cost of free websites like Facebook. What? Facebook might not always be in my best interest. Shocking. Shocking. <laughs> so please, uh, you know, go grab some food and uh, and we'll uh, see you back here in just under an hour. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the second half of Data Driven 2021 Day 1. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today, who is uh, Surya Matu from The Markup. And uh, a little bit about Surya here. He's a broken based investigative journalist, artist and engineer who looks at the ways in which algorithmic systems perpetuate systemic biases and inequities in society. And uh, he, before working at the market, he previously was a contributing researcher at ProPublica, where he worked on machine bias a series and the aims to highlight how algorithmic systems can be biased and discriminated against people. And was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for explanatory journalism. So welcome, Surya. Hi, thank you so much for having me and putting together this conference, David. Can no you problem. hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you fine. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to get going. Awesome, all right, great. So hi, everyone. Um, Nice to meet you. Um, I can't see any of you, but if you have any questions along the way, I, I, is there a way for me to see that, or is that just? Uh, would you yeah, there, there's a there's a Q and A function, and so people are encouraged to please. Uh, you can plop them in there, and I, I'll see them, and I'll I'll accept them. And then when we when we shift to the, you can let me know if you want me to pop in with questions or. Yes. Yeah, or, so yeah. just pop in whenever. So I'm I'm hoping I'm going to be talking about. It about Blacklight, a project I worked on at the markup that we released in the fall, and I'm hoping to like kind of just go through it and kind of dig into how we made it, what it is, why, how we made it and why we made it, and just kind of how maybe people could use it for their own stories. So if anyone has questions along the way, just feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. Sure. OK, sounds good. Awesome. So right, I'm going to share my desktop now so you won't see me. I just want to first shout out the T-shirt I'm wearing. It's a markup T-shirt when scraping is not a crime. If you want to buy it, I think you can still buy it from our store. Um, but I can send you a link to that later. And now I will start. So I'm going to go to my desktop. Uh, all right. So. OK, so hopefully you guys can see this. So just yeah, so you can see my screen right and you can see the tool. I'm just making sure that that's true. Yeah, all right. So. Yeah, like I said, um, my name is Surya. I'm an investigative data journalist at The Markup. Um, that's where I've been working for the last couple of years. And um, I'm really excited to talk to you about our project Blacklight today. Um, stuff I'm going to basically cover in this talk is what is Blacklight? What does it do? Why did we build it? And how you can use it for your own reporting and how you can learn more about the tool if you are interested. So I'm going to just kind of dive right in. And like I said earlier, if you have any questions, feel free to um, stop me at any point and ask them. OK, so what is Blacklight? Blacklight is a real-time website privacy inspector. What does that mean? It's basically what we do is it's a it's a tool that lets you go to type in a URL. So let's say I type in the New York Times. What it does is it goes in real time and makes a request to a web browser that's running in the cloud, and we've scripted that web browser with some custom function that allows us to run essentially these seven different, how many is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, seven different tests. And what it does is it actually goes, It when you hit a New York Times in this URL box, it actually goes and makes a request to the New York Times. As you can see here, it went to these two separate pages and it runs these seven tests. So. These seven tests, I'm going to like just talk about each test individually because um, they kind of, I would like broadly kind of describe them as being falling into three separate categories. 
Um, the first two, which like you can see in the New York Times, are the most common ones. So this is like the most traditional kind of typical type of tracking that people think of when they think of what kind of tracking happens on the internet. Right? So it's third party cookies. These are basically small pieces of text that get tagged to a person as they browse the internet. And they've, they're the traditional way in which um, targeted advertising builds profile, targeted advertisers build profiles of you on the internet. So what Facebook does, Google does, and a bunch of others. So it's not surprising that you'd see that a site like the New York Times, which you know has a bunch of um, ads on it, would have these kinds of cookies to, to target, target their users. Um, the second type of tracking we do, we look for is called just typical ad trackers. So the difference between ad trackers and cookies, again, very traditional kind of form of tracking. Ad trackers are what we define as basically things that typical ad blockers would uh, would block against. So if you use something like uBlock, you know, like this, or like Privacy Badger, these are the things that um, these sites would, these tools would block against. And Blacklight actually relies on the easy list. So there's this list called the easy privacy list, which is a bunch of different, um, uh, which is basically a long list of domains that are known to be um, that are known to be tracking users and they're all listed here. And what Blacklight does is it looks at all the network requests going through um, the page and sees if any requests are being to the, being made to those domains. And then it just basically counts up how many domains are being called. So again, on the New York Times, there were 12 um, ad trackers that we that we found um, belonging to you know Chartbeat, Adobe Inc, Oracle, Microsoft, and these other companies. Um, so those are the first. So that's kind of the more typical traditional tracking the way we think of it. Then the next test is this thing called canvas fingerprinting. This is kind of this is way a little more wild. Uh, let's see if I can find a website that does canvas fingerprinting. Yeah, wild. Um, so canvas fingerprinting is basically a technique that was developed to um, kind of sidestep ad blocking. So typical ad blockers like uBlock or Privacy Badger, like I mentioned, what they they do is they they block network requests that they know are being made to shady domains, and they block third-party cookies which are used to uniquely identify um, a user. So when users started using these kind of cookie blockers um, more commonly, advertisers found a way around them, and essentially that was canvas fingerprinting. And what canvas fingerprinting does is it actually lets user, lets the ad tracker, um, what they do, they literally do is they draw an invisible canvas with this image. So on, on wired.com, on one of these pages of wired.com, a script drew this image on your, on my, on the computer, on the browser invisibly. And the exact pixel values for that image on that particular piece of hardware will be different than most others. And that is a way that they can use to uniquely identify users. So basically, this was a way for um, for trackers, tracking companies to track users even if they block third party cookies. So we can see, for example, on Wired, this is being done by AUFP.io. Now, this is the kind of tracking that even uh, that most ad blockers won't block against because it's not based on the domain. It's actually kind of based on some JavaScript that's running in the code. We describe all of these techniques in more detail in our methodology, which is called how we build a real time privacy inspector. And you know, I can show you a couple of examples. The canvas print the fingerprinting examples are pretty wild. They always look like this, you know, and like each one of these are basically the way my computer will draw them would be different, slightly different to yours, depending on what graphics card our computers use, how the, how exactly they handle font aliasing and other other things. So so one of the reasons we built Blacklight was because you can't see, there's no easy way to detect whether canvas fingerprinting is happening on a website. And it's one of the most kind of egregious ways of user tracking that currently takes place. So the third test we're looking for is canvas fingerprinting. The fourth one is not tracking in the traditional sense of how we think about it for the surveillance economy. This is actually monitoring for something called session recording. Now session recording is this technique that's basically used by, by first party companies to see how users are behaving on their website. So like so basically 
when you go to wired.com, they're actually looking in great detail at how you move your mouse and click around to see exactly what parts of a page um, a user's interacting with. So they use this um, script from a company called Hotjar. I'm going to quickly show you what Hotjar looks like. So Hotjar builds these, these heat maps that allow you to see exactly how a user is um, using your website. And you know, there's some value in this, I'm sure, for like um, from a user experience perspective or like a design perspective. But the problem is that we, we, no one is told that they're essentially being monitored in such granular detail. Like when we when we were looking into this, there was actually a company called Inspectlet that offers this survey that serve the service that literally says on their website um, that you can record everything your visitors do, and it's literally like watch individual users use your site as if you're looking in over their shoulders. So this is literally how they um, they market their tool. I wonder if they still do it. Oh, temporarily allow. I'm using my ad blocker, which is good, but it's blocking Inspectlet, I guess. Um, OK, it doesn't want to go, but yeah, essentially that's what session recorders do. So this isn't like this isn't the kind of tracking where, you know, they're necessarily selling this data for advertising or some other purpose, but it is something that like can be really risky um, and cause a lot of data leakage. Actually, when we did a story that went with that went with the launch of this tool, which I'll talk about more in detail later. We actually found a bank called SunTrust was sending their username and passwords that people so like so Blacklight actually under the hood when you go to it, it it automatically fills up every text field it finds with a bunch of um, known text. So any anytime it sees like a date field, it'll enter this date. Anytime it, it sees an email field, it'll enter this email address. Anytime it sees a password field, it'll enter this password, and then it looks to see in the network request if this data was being sent to a third party. And we never click submit. So if data is being sent, it actually uh, means that this data was being key logged, which is actually is another test. But what we found was that um, there was this there's this bank called SunTrust that was actually sending username and password data to a third party Jornaya on their website by default, even though they didn't uh, realize it. And this was obviously happening because um, well, not obviously, but this was happening because they clearly had like adjusted their settings in a confusing way, didn't know that they were doing it, etc. And Jornaya is one of these companies that that basically is essentially a data broker, um, and they show you how you can use your customers' data to build um, to build a profile on them and target them better. So that's why we're looking at session recording. It's not that like it's being used in the surveillance economy in the way that you would expect third-party cookies and ad trackers to be used. But there's real risks in how this data is leaked and like what kind of consequences that can have. Uh, sorry, yeah, just a quick thing. Uh, we've had a request if you could make your screen a little bit bigger. Oh, yes, certainly. Sorry about that. Is that better? I think that's a little better. Yeah, I can see it better. Thanks. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to make all of these a little bit better. Yeah, just let me know if it feels too small and I cannot adjust it. So I'll show you that fingerprinting thing again because that's really I, my, one of my favorites uh, in there. All right, so yeah, so that was, um, so going back to it, so this is session recording, right? This is basically um, ways in which you can track users, mouse movements, clicks, taps, and scrolls, and the ways in which companies are doing that often can leak user data with the, the, without them even realizing. So imagine like if this is running on a website like, um, you know, we've we've seen it running on like abortion clinic websites. We've seen it running on, on I think the Mayo Clinic had it running, where basically when you type stuff into a form, it was sending data over the network without users even clicking the submit button. So they didn't realize that data was being transferred uh, even before they had clicked the submit button. So that's kind of why we do this test. The key logging test is essentially similar. Uh, is is similar to the session recording one. The session recording test is looking for specific session recording software. The key logging test is just looking for any comp any any website, any script that is doing key logging on a given website. Um, I don't know if this is still true, but it, we've I had once found this on uh, I mean, actually a good example of this is um, so now this one is a little slower because MNMs is actually running live um, on the browser, so it takes up to 30 seconds for for the results uh, to come back. So I'm going to wait for a second to let this run. 
In the meantime, I'll also set up another one of my favorite websites that does stuff. Um, yeah, right, so m and mscom really fun. Uh, you know, so th th these are the two websites, the web pages I went to, and we found um, that they were actually capturing keystrokes, and we actually find that they are sending uh, email and password data to the Oracle Corporation um, on their, um, so I forget exactly which script it is, but I'll go, I'll walk it through the details of how we can find out. I'm looking at the raw data in a second. But yeah, so key logging is another feature we look for. And then these last two tests aren't really technically any different from the first two in terms of looking for cookies and ad trackers, but because of the prevalence of the Facebook Pixel and Google Analytics on the internet, it, we felt like it was worth breaking them out into their own separate tests. So the Facebook Pixel is basically a piece of code that Facebook pro pro provides uh, website developers they can stick on their website just essentially to allow them to retarget people who've been to their website. So let's say I've been to, um, let's say I've been to, um, I don't know, Nike.com um, and I saw a pair of shoes. Now Nike wants to be able to target, advertise those shoes to me when I'm on Facebook. The Facebook pixel is the way that they can do that. The pixel basically knows who I am because they have a cookie stored in my browser linked to my Facebook profile. They send that data to Nike saying, hey, this user was using the Facebook user said this user was on this particular page. And then Nike can say, hey, show shoes that people saw on this page to the users on Facebook, and that's how they can target them. So the only reason we, we put this one in because this tends to be really prevalent, and a lot of people don't know that Facebook is collecting data off Facebook. So they're building our profiles when we go to sites that you like you know wouldn't expect. So um, so like when you go to mnms.com, that's actually being added to your Facebook profile. I think when you go to even like um, like a more, there's a bunch of different websites that you can go to where like that kind of information is being shared and built and being used to build your Facebook profile. In addition to that, we also look for Google Analytics. Now with Google Analytics, that's not actually a tracking technology, but there's a particular service they offer called remarketing audiences, which essentially works in the same way as the Facebook pixel, which is that when someone comes to your website and if you have the remarketing audiences feature enabled on Google Analytics, it allows you to track those people through the internet and target ads to them using double click on Google ads. Um, and that's what we're testing for here. So again, in this particular context, it's not that surprising that you know a company like M&Ms would be trying to target ads to the people who came and visited the website. So it's not that egregious. It is a little weird that like um, they're leaking email and password data from their sign in page um, to a third party, but that you know that's a slightly different problem than that one than the other one. So those are the those are the tests we run and it took us a long time to come down to these tests. This does not encapsulate all the things that you need to know about tracking on the internet. But the reason we landed on these seven tests is because they were the easiest for us to precisely be able to measure and provide evidence about exactly how they're happening uh, to users so that they can, so it's clear and not just some vague thing or like it could be happening, it couldn't be happening. There's other forms of fingerprinting where, or like tracking where we can't be definitively clear, sure that like it's 100% happening. And because, you know, essentially we're like accusing these companies of doing privacy invasive techniques, you wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing was, was built in a way that we could back up our claims. So for example, with um, M&Ms, right? And like with this particular one, if you wanted to dig into this deeper, when you, you go to the learn more section over here and open it up, there's actually a download and archive option. And I'm going to walk through it real quick to show you what we provide in this. So this was really built with the idea that if someone wants to do um, data collection for their own reporting and their own stories, they would be able to use the data they find on Backlight as evidence that can be used for that purpose. So I just downloaded it and I'm just unzipping the, the folder and I can show it to you here. Let's see if I can make this any bigger. Oh, let me just fix this. Give me one second. Uh, see if I can open this with a text editor.
Sorry. One second. Downloads. Hopefully you're not seeing anything too incriminating on my computer when I do this. We have a question right now, sorry, while you're doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the question is by from Ying, by publishing your methodology so thoroughly, um, are you are you not concerned that these audiences might try to circumvent detection? Say, for example, detecting usernames that match the published values. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, this is 100% a cat and mouse game, and I think um, the, we, this will end over time and new techniques will evolve. So this is something we're going to have to keep updating. The thing to in our advantage over here at the moment is that a lot like the amount of money they make of like third party cookies, for example, or session recording facilities is too much to be to worry about what we're claiming. And at the moment, unfortunately, there aren't any real consequences for these bad actions. You know, someone might call them out. It might be reported on, but that stuff tends to get forgotten. Like they, there's no real fines or anything like that that we've seen yet kind of come into play for these actions. Some FTC, um, you know, cases have have led to uh, pretty significant um, kind of fines, but overall it's not it's not uh, it's not that easy yet for enforcement to happen on these issues. So we haven't I think people are more lazy than than that. And like, you know, they, they kind of just like there is a problem they have to worry about. They don't worry about it and it's definitely going to change. But you know, like when we started making Blacklight, I already thought like focusing on third party cookies was stupid because it's such an old technique and everyone was moving away from them. But then you go and see and there's still like, you know, 67 cookies on the on the m and website. And it's honestly just because like removing legacy code from your page is honestly a pain in the ass and a lot of people tend not to do it. Um, so it just tends to linger for longer. But to his point, like it's a really good question, and we will have to periodically update Blacklight to ensure it's um, it's up to date with the latest with the latest information. Um, does that any follow ups? Uh, there was another question I think that was um, you know Paul asked, what if you are in a uh, quote in private page whereby you are anonymous? Can any data be captured aside from your keystrokes? Um, yes, yeah, so if even if you're in an in, in, a, in private page, if you if you find uh, canvas fingerprinting taking place, which is um, I have to find a website that does it again. Let's go back to Wired, which is this technique, the canvas fingerprinting where they draw the image. This would still be able to take place and uniquely identify your device, even if you were in a private page. Because a private page basically blocks all cookies um, and any kind of session information that might be stored in the page. But these these um, these kinds of tracking techniques circumvent that um, that stuff. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and then I just got one more uh, right now, which was from uh, sorry if I don't pronounce this right, uh, Jordi Pajeski. Uh, have you looked at privacy policies of examined websites to compare their disclosure with what they actually do? Yeah, so that's a really good question and we did and honestly most websites vaguely disclose this. The problem is that people don't really understand the details of it. So they say that, you know, we collect data on users for the purposes of providing them with a good service or showing them ads. And that is essentially what they're doing. Now they're not telling you that they're scribbling some weird images on your computer in a way that you might not want to consent to to do that. And it's those details where it becomes a little harder to tease it out. So they're covered from a legal perspective in the way they've written their privacy policy, but it isn't like, but if people actually knew the mechanics of how it is taking place, that's actually personally, I think, gross. So that's kind of why, that's actually why we called the tool Blacklight, was kind of like, we think of this as like a health inspection, like, you know, how you go to a restaurant and have a health inspector, like, look at like how gross it is. That's how we're that's kind of how we're building. We're building the tool to kind of measure that in a in a concrete and like empirical way. And we're hoping by showing this, we'll be able to have more meaningful conversations about what the risks of tracking are and what the problems are. So we aren't just kind of stuck in the typical conversation of like, well, if you want free stuff, you have to have tracking. And it's like, you know, like which is like a way a lot of these companies try to circumvent this this conversation. 
uh, we want to really be able to go into slightly more kind of nuance and detail about like okay maybe we need some tracking but really like if i go to like you know in our in our investigation that we did with this with this story we found things like um you know tracking was taking place on like sites serving undocumented immigrants domestic and sexual abuse survivors sex workers and lgbtq um, people right and this is data that like is being generated to send advertisers just to because they, there's no like distinction um in that information and often like the web administrators who make these websites don't even know this tracking is kind of going on on their website in fact this investigation we did, uh, where Aaron Sankin, my reporting partner, who really informed a lot of how Black Knight was built in the end, he spoke to Kara at Sparta Pride, uh, the small nonprofit serving transgender um, military people, and she she didn't know she when we we emailed her with our findings from Black Knight about trackers coming existing on the site, and she said there is no way I have trackers on my website. And she didn't even know because when she built the website, she was checking it on Firefox with her ad blocker set. So she didn't see the trackers coming through, but she was using a service called Add This, which was introducing third party cookies onto her website. So essentially, when you went to Sparta Pride, she added, sorry, it was Discuss, the, the comment platform. She added Discuss because it was part of like a free template that, that she was using to build the website. And then Discuss piggybacked 21 different trackers onto her website because that's just how the platform works. Now discuss in their terms of service do disclose that this happens on the free version of their website, but people don't really necessarily know that. And you go to Sparta Pride, you don't think that kind of tracking would be taking place because the way it presents itself isn't like a commercial site. So that's kind of what we're trying to target in, in the way we're building this the pervasiveness of it. Great. Yeah. Is that up? Cool. All right. So um so going back to MMs and the data I got from there. Um, so this is basically what a report looks like when you download it. Um, we haven't really advertised this as well as we should on our website, and we're going to get to that. But I'll just show you what the folder looks like. Um, as you can see, I have a bunch of different inspections. So basically, yeah, the, let me make this bigger because you obviously cannot see this. Um, how do I? This? I actually don't know how to make my finder window bigger. Um, all right, so maybe I'll just try to go through it in the in the browser instead. So this is um, essentially the same report you see on the website. We down we give you a file with it so that you can just see um, you can just see all that information in a local file without it without needing to go back to the web page because you know we cache our results for 24 hours and then we, kill, we then we kill it and then in addition to that we also allow people to see the raw data that um, made up the report so so the the really interesting things in here i think are um the most interesting one in from my perspective is this file called risk requests.har which i'll show you how you can use so if you go if you google uh har analyzer there's basically this har analy har is like a http archive format essentially what it lets you do is it lets you see playback all the network requests that were made through the session of the blacklight test so if i go in here and i open this request.har file i can actually see all the network requests that were made to mnms in that particular test so if you're making a claim about like that data being leaked will actually be able to show them. So this is what we did for the SunTrust Bank um, anecdote in the story. They were like, we definitely do not leak username and password data, you're lying. And then we were like, nope, here we go. We have literal, we literally have the data and the exact network request, the exact information where it was leaked and you can see it for yourself over here. So you can, if you run an inspection on Blacklight, you too will be able to see this data. In addition to that, we also provide um, the inspection.json file, which is essentially the raw data generated from a blacklight um, test, and all of that information can all of, it contains all the information that then eventually populates the front end, right? So it's like who is doing canvas fingerprinting? Let me make this a little bigger. What kind of cookies are being used? What Facebook pixel events are running on this page? There's a lot more in here than we actually even show, but like over here, you can see in the key logging one 
that there was a site on, on the M&M's website, fullstory.com, which is a session recorder, was capturing this piece of text that was going over this network request that we made. Right, so this was actually leakage of a username and password that was happening on this site right now as we tested it. And you can see who is getting that information. You can also see that bronto.com was getting my email address um, and full story was getting my username and password. Um, and this is kind of how we use this for reporting. We, um, we ended up um, kind of getting into the situation where Aaron was like running Blacklight again and again on different websites. And through that, we were able to um, to find all these anecdotes in the different ways in which uh, people are being tracked on the internet. Um, all right, so what have I covered so far? So I think I've covered what is Blacklight. I haven't really covered why did we build it. I have a little bit, but I'll talk a little more to that now, uh, which is essentially, originally this was going to be an internal tool for us. It was really going to be for us to use for reporting on these stories. And when we when we started, the idea was actually to do a, a census. So the originally I was going to like basically run, I built the tooling to allow us to capture data on 1 million websites or like 100,000 of the top most popular websites the way a lot of academics do it to show the current state of tracking on the internet. And we did do that and we've actually kind of mentioned it in our, uh, we, we talk about it in our methodology. But we found when we did this that like, it's not really personal. It kind of, I have this thing that I always say at work, which is we want our readers to get, have a sense of agency after reading our work, not a sense of apathy. And what I felt when we showed them this thing about the survey and the way that, you know, how many websites are still tracking us, and it's a lot, and you can see this in the methodology, people, it doesn't really translate to a user, a person's lived experience of the internet. They don't really know how it affects them. And, you know, we all go to like popular websites, like, you know, big news websites, they may be like the Times or Fox News or whatever. But then there are all these other sites that we go to, which aren't these big websites <coughs> like SpartaPride.com, like maybe the ACLU or other things. And those are the ones where really, I think people, it's more egregious to see the kind of tracking. Like, you know, one of the reasons we did this is we wanted parents to be able to see what kind of tracking was taking place on sites their kids might be using, right? And when we built this, it is an internal tool. There was no easy way to provide that information to users. So that's actually why it ended up becoming a public facing tool. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, that's how that went. And as we were, rip, and, and the other thing that was really um, important in, in this process for me was I was building this from a technical perspective and trying to make sure it's as precise and forensically accurate as I could make it. But working with Aaron, I realized that it also had to like tell a story because he kept looking through this data and be like, I don't care. Who cares if like there's, you know, 50 trackers on Wired, like we kind of know that. Where is the interesting stuff? And he is the per he's the one who actually thought of going to all these other websites, you know, these vulnerable websites that you wouldn't expect to have trackers to see what kind of tracking was taking place on those. So, you know, like things like this, 80 US abortion providers loaded third party trackers on users pages. Um, the Arizona Department of Child Safety page um, had um, ad tech six, six ad tech companies on the page of how to report child uh, abuse um, on the web pages allowed you to do that. The Mayo Clinic did key logging. You know, there are all of these different like ways in which our data is being leaked. If we don't think about usually when we're talking about tracking online because we just think about the big most popular websites. So really the motivation behind, uh, behind Blacklight was to allow users to see this with their own experience, download the data, and really be able to ask questions of the people who are who are building it. Um, this is a little. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, that, I was going to say that was a great segue. Uh, speaking of questions, uh, I've got a few more for you. Yeah. Um, uh, Georgie, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Georgie had another question, which was, uh, "What's next for Blacklight? What features do you want to have, or would like to add in the future?" Right, so really good question. Um, I think for me personally, I want to. Well, so one thing that Blacklight doesn't do is it doesn't click on the consent box. Uh, if you have like a consent box in a website, so if you go to the Guardian, for example, you see this little your privacy box that pops up where you it says you you accept or don't accept to sell your personal data. Um, 
this uh, I want to be able to click on that so you can because what I, what's up, ends up happening is like you don't see as many trackers are actually loaded because most people just click through this and and accept all the cookies and they don't realize what they're really accepting. So one thing I want to figure out how to do is allow us to click in that and that's hard to do in a way that's like uh, principled and generalizable for all websites in a, because I really try right now not to click on anything. Um, because it causes a lot of different kinds of problems, but that's that's one thing. Um, another thing I think I want to do is um, set it up so that so right now Blacklight does all the tests. So this is actually in the pipeline. I'm telling you what's coming next. It's, I don't know when it'll come out. It'll come out at some point. We want to run tests from different regions, so you can run the tests from the same website on in the US, in the EU, in Asia, and see how these websites look differently to different audiences. You know, starting off, we obviously started in the US because it was easier for us. But that's another thing we want to do. And then just also paying attention to what new kind of tracking techniques are coming up and how um, how we can uh, how we can incorporate those. You know, a thing that we rely on very heavily. Um, for Blacklight is this thing called the Tracker Radar Dataset that DuckDuckGo releases. This essentially provides us with the list of all trackers that we use to then kind of figure out which companies are doing the tracking, which is another thing that Blacklight does that isn't easily available, is it tells you who's doing the tracking. It doesn't just like block the tracking. Um, so that's another thing that uh, needs to be updated. And kind of, so it, it's, it's we, we thought a lot about the maintenance aspect of Blacklight and there's a lot and essentially I hope to be able to update it and once a year um, and key, kind of keep it fresh, but it's a lot of work <laughs> to do that unfortunately. Uh, so we had another question which is from Marcelo who says, OK, so what do we do? How do we protect ourselves? Yeah, good, uh, good question. There's not like there's some things you can do. We actually have an Ask the Markup and Explainer on our website that talks about this. Yeah, I think I see the chat now, so maybe I can drop it in here. Can I do this? Oh, yeah. yeah. Work? OK, good. Um, so this explains a little bit about how you can protect yourself on a browser. But really, like from my perspective, like this the point of Blacklight is actually to be a tool of inquiry to ask questions of the people who make the websites we rely on, you know, like meaningful questions about what kind of technologies they use. You know, I don't think like the joke I always make with my colleagues is like, I don't want my mom to feel bad that she's being tracked on the internet because it's really not her fault that that's happening and it shouldn't be on her to be really sophisticated in her usage. But I do think that people who are making these tools and this technology, we should be able to ask meaningful questions of them about why they're being used in the first place. Because what we found is if you ask those questions to those people, often these things go away. Because one, they either don't know it's happening, they're too busy with other stuff to worry about it, and no one is framing the question in a way that they know how to address it. So what we're really hoping is that like, with tools like Blacktide, we can um, make it easier to shine a light on these kind of practices so that we can have a more holistic approach to how we deal with them and not kind of push it down to the consumer or like the regular internet user to feel like it's their responsibility to fix all of these issues for themselves. Thanks. And uh, Miha also had a question, which was, uh, are these tracking techniques utilized only for ads or could they be used for other purposes? And if so, do you have any other examples? Totally, yeah. So. Um, so like the so again from what is publicly available a lot of the ad trackers and third party cookie information is definitely used for ads but session recording which was the thing where they monitor your keystrokes and your mouse clicks that's not um, that's not for advertising that's actually for seeing how users are using your website and you know that could like if it was used in a weird way that could be used to stalk people online um there's a bunch of different ways in which um, this data is harmful. Like if so, for example, as I just showed you on M&Ms, right? I go back to it. If you see this, it says it captured a third part. So like imagine doing this. Right? You go to M I'm going to show you what this is the equivalent of doing. It's the equivalent of doing this. Go to MMS.com. And if I have autocomplete set up on my key, my, my browser, it would be the equivalent of clicking here, having it automatically type stuff in here, and having that data be sent to a third party without my consent, even before I've clicked sign in. Now, this data, right? If there's a data breach on the company that this data is being sent to, 
Now that is my username and password data that has been leaked and then it's going to make me more vulnerable in a variety of different ways. So there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole bunch of ways in which it can be problematic. Um, I see there's another question. Does that answer the question? Um, I can't see the original one now. It was me who published it. Sorry, I'm just uh, doing that. Weird uh, okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. So the next one: Can hackers embed these trackers on authorized sites without the corporation being aware? For instance, yep, that's definitely something that does happen. Ad fraud and tracking fraud is like a whole beast that I personally don't even fully understand myself, but that is definitely um, something that is possible and does it does happen um, often. I don't know about government websites and banks. I think nowadays they're a little more sophisticated, but it's it definitely happens like um, on like the like the smaller scale banks and like websites that don't have like sophisticated security teams. Um, all right, the next one. How could I investigate tracking on a site that's password protected? Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's a really good question. The way Blacklight, the tool, and this is a good segue for me to quickly talk about one more thing. Uh, so the way Blacklight, the tool works online is not really designed for um, that logged in data because it's, you know, there's a browser running in the cloud that's doing this kind of data collection. But if you're so interested, you can actually go to our GitHub. Um, let me just pull it up for you. So we actually make all this code open source. It's actually an NPM module for people who are technically who have like friends who can code or, or can code themselves. And you can run um, essentially NPM install at the markup blacklight collector and you can run it locally. And if you run it locally, you can um, you will be able to script it to, uh, to to log into a particular website. If you need help with that, reach out and I can kind of walk you through. It's a little complicated, but it is. It is possible. Um, is this kind of research possible on mobile? Not easily. Um, actually, when we run all our tests for Blacklight, we emulate a mobile device. Um, so it looks like a mobile device. So if you see the pages as they're loaded, these are actually like mobile versions of the site, not the not the um, desktop versions. But that's the best we can do so far. Um, how do I get the hard file generated by Blacklight? Yeah, so to do that, again, I so apologize for it being hidden, but essentially, if this is what you see on Blacklight, you can um, click on Learn More, and there's a Download and Archive button here, and if you click on that, you'll be able to get that whole package, and you can also see that in our um, see some, in our tip section. So you can send this to us if you want to send us a tip or you can also download it over here. The other thing I didn't mention um, that I should have is that we also list all the companies that were found on this website that are known to be tracking in which of their domains were found. So, you know, on New York Times, Everest Tech, which belongs to Adobe, all these domains that belong to Google, Comscore has this. So like it allows you to basically look at this tracking from the lens of the actual companies doing it and which companies are getting this data, not just the, the, the domain that is that this data is being sent to. That's another thing that uh, this allows you to do. All right, so I can keep blabbering about this. I think I'm almost out of time. So are there any other questions or thoughts, feelings, comments? I'm happy to take them. Uh, yeah, Adil said that he, he, he gave a shout out for the uh, social dilemma <laughs> on Netflix. Which I, I I mean I can say that I I liked parts of it I thought a little bit of it was a little hammy but other than that it was it was good it's a good intro I think yes. people have no idea about what it is right yeah yeah my sister after watching it said to me she's like oh I get what you've been complaining about for the last decade now <laughs> so I think it I think it was a good entry point but yeah I think for people who've been in this been working on this for a long time a lot of them were frustrated that that the people who actually been doing this research were not called out uh, or not like kind of like given excited in the work that they are to kind of so who we talking about. But they made it sound like this. No one knew this was happening when a lot of people understood it quite early on what the risks were. Great. So yeah, I mean, uh, is there anything? Uh, what are you besides Blacklight? Is there anything you're you're working on that you can tell us about? The, the, you're yeah, right. the one that's uh, I've been really busy with recently is another project called Citizen Browser, uh, which is basically we built like a, a panel of users uh, of Facebook users uh, in the US and we've given them an app that they can download that lets them um, share their Facebook data with us. 
So it essentially is like a, it's almost like a national panel of Facebook users in the US, and we've been able to do stories on like how Facebook is still pushing political groups to people, even though they say they aren't, and um, a bunch of other stuff um, around around that. We found some partisanship in the Georgia elections too, but this has been like a, like I need like another whole hour to talk about this in more detail. But if you're interested in how we did it, you can read our how we built a Facebook inspector methodology. I'll link to it in the chat. People who are interested in this. Yeah, feel free if you'd like to plug uh, a link to Facebook Inspector um, in the uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, in the chat, I'll leave that up for people. And uh, that pretty much brings us to the, to the end there. So thank you so much, Surya, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for asking so many questions. Yeah, so I guess now we're going to take a quick uh, 15 minute break. Once again, resume with uh, Lucas Timmons from the Canadian Press. So thanks, everyone. Hello everyone and welcome back to Data Driven 2021. I am here right now with Lucas Timmons, who is the head of the D3 team at the Canadian Press, where he leads a team of developers and journalists in an effort to automate digital print and graphical news stories. Currently working on some really cool stuff uh, and uh, we're going to have him talk a bit about that right now. Hi, welcome Lucas. Hi, thanks for having me. So I'm going to uh, this, just share my my screen now. Good to go? Yep, we're good to go. Uh, we'll see you in a sec. You have to also tell me how you do. Your your resume page is awesome uh, for anyone who hasn't, hasn't seen it. Uh, it's really cool. It's like a video game. But uh, that's a topic for another day. Oh, sure. Yeah, just lucastimmons.com. It's fun. It's, uh, you know, it's fun to learn JavaScript. I'm going to plug it there. Okay, so you can see, uh, you should be able to see my screen now. We're good? Yep. Okay, uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Lucas Timmons. Uh, I'm the head of the D3 at uh, Canadian Press for the Digital Data Desk, and we are basically trying to automate as much news coverage as we can in order to free up reporters to do something uh, that, you know, computers can't do. Uh, it's sort of the main goal of what we're doing here. We have a lot of really talented reporters at CP, and they shouldn't be doing you know, wrote repetitive sort of stuff when computers can do it for them. They should be out using the skills that they have. So we're trying to help them there. Um, and speaking of, you know, wrote repetitive tasks, COVID-19. Um, yeah. As wire service, we have a lot of clients who are looking for accurate and up-to-date COVID-19 information and numbers, uh, either for use as stories, to drop it into their stories or into their broadcasts, you know, um, or to run as individual items. And in the early days of the pandemic, the numbers were coming in at irregular intervals and from multiple different sources, different governments. Uh, getting a clear overall picture of the pandemic was difficult, especially in the early days. It took a lot of time and effort to get information from all 13 provinces, territories, and then the feds. Um, so, you know, we would be updating the story multiple on the wire multiple times per day, and it would be recorder, reporters across the country would be doing it. So there was a lot of different responsibility at different days of the week. It depended on who was doing it. Provinces would update at different times. And we really needed a system that would keep the stories with an identical format, it would eliminate, you know, the possibility for errors, which which is big when there's a ton of people working on the same thing. And that was fast. Um, like I said, we also want to free up time for our reporters to do other work. And as an added bonus, we wanted to keep the data for us to use it for things later. Um, we also decided we wanted to do some charts to go along with the stories. And uh, this is what we ended up coming up with and what we've been using to this day. So we talked about the motivation. Um, they wanted COVID-19 updates. We wanted to free up reporters time. So what we ended up doing was developing a system to automate stories about uh, the country, provinces and territories that involves cases, you know, new and resolved, positivity rates, per capita rolling averages, um, deaths, vaccinations, charts to go with those sorts of things. Uh, like I said, it has new, new cases, completed tests, positivity rates, case per capita, rolling averages, deaths, weekly deaths, all that stuff. Um, and it didn't start out right that way. You know, there was a few iterations before we got there. Um, we also wanted to generate stuff in French because we do do stories in English and French. So we also generate uh, a story in English and a story in French about vaccinations being administered and delivered, and we also generate some charts for our graphics clients to use. Uh, so this was the first 
you know, the first iteration of it. This took about a day to build. Um, the chart at the bottom was added a day later. We did something really quick and this worked and it's still going to kind of work now, even though it's uh, kind of obsolete. Um, but you click the button. It came up with a very simple quick hit type story, the number of confirmed cases by province and then this chart. And this is uh, an early version of it before we did CP style and, and copy edited it. Um, it was the only one I could get working <laughs> for the presentation. But basically, yeah, it uh, we got the numbers. We stored them. We you click a button, it writes the story. It gives you the chart. You click the button to download the chart. You copy and paste the story into the content management system, and you're ready to go. Um, it was quick and it worked. One of the, the big problems we faced was how to store and update this data, and make doing that easy for any reporter anywhere in the country, and have the data stored in a format that we can use. Um, you know, it's not trivial considerations there. So the story generator itself uses the data in a JSON format, um, along with some logic that we've written for the software to go through and write this story. The charts uh, use D3JS, um, so they're basically SVGs with HTML elements, and they use the same data format. So really, we needed the data in a JSON format. Uh, getting reporters to put data into JSON is that's simply not possible. Um, even using like a shared CSV file that anyone could access across the country was going to be very difficult to do because um, then not only would we have to deal with the problems of maybe people trying to use it at the same time or uh, somebody accidentally deleting it, which could possibly happen. We'd also have to get the data into JSON format again. So the best solution for us and what we ended up coming with coming up with was to use Google Sheets. Um, so we haven't used this since December, but this was a really easy tool. It's something all reporters you know, have used before, they're familiar with. It's free, it's simple, it has version control, which was really important for us, and it can be used by multiple people at the same time. Um, and with a little bit of work, you can also modify any of these sheets to be uh, an insecure API endpoint. Um, and I know we've got a lot of students watching today, so an API is an application programming interface, Basically, we're using it to interface with the database and get data in a usable format. So people can put the, the numbers in here and we can have a link on the Internet that we can get that has the numbers in JSON format that we can use for programming what we need to do. Um, and like I said, it had. Uh, you know, the history of all the changes. That should load up in a second here. And so you can see exactly when someone made a change and what they change, and you can revert to that in case a mistake was made. And this is going to lead to the number one lesson that we found um, in any of the things that we've done. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation, it's this. People don't follow the directions. It doesn't matter what. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't follow the directions. And so you need to plan for that and try to mitigate that. So having version control of this sort of thing is very, very helpful. Um, because we say go to the go to the the bar at the top, the formula bar, and type in the numbers. And so some people still copy and paste, and then they'll copy and paste in numbers that are incorrectly formatted, and then the whole thing breaks down. So being able to go back and uh, whoops, find that is great. So um, yeah, Google Sheets was easy, and it worked for us for a long time. We kind of wanted to expand what the generator would do. And we also wanted to eliminate that still little chance for human error. Um, it was still our reporters who were getting the numbers and putting it in. Luckily for us, uh, the government of Canada at finally started getting their act together and they put together this site, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, this is sort of their daily. Well, I guess it's updated daily, but it includes all their COVID information and you can get the data as a CSV. So we built a system to basically connect to that page to download the, the data as a CSV, uh, to upload it to our own database, and then we built our own API to connect to that database with the information we needed. And this is what we came up with. Um, we ended up expanding the number of charts that we did to four. We also greatly expanded the type of data that we were, uh, we were able to to use because there was a lot more data there than just the case numbers. So these are starting to look more like actual little stories. Um, they're about four paragraphs and they do it for each province and territory and nationally. And this included um, 
new cases, number of tests, positivity rates, the rate of active cases, you know, the look back at the last week, that type of thing. Um, we've also moved to a new content management system at CP. So we're in the process of opening up uh, an API to have these stories just go automatically into the new content management system rather than have them run through uh, this web interface. But this was uh, something that we had built a little while back and it worked for a while, but we're always trying to make things better. Um, and now, this is the system that we have running. It uh, does that story that you saw before, plus it does vaccination stories based on the latest vaccination data. Uh, and it does that in English and both in French, which was a pretty big challenge, but we managed to get that done. We also still have the same charts uh, that we had before, but I'll go back up here. And uh, the, the vaccination data pulls from the, uh, the working group. We teamed up with them uh, to talk about the data and the story of the COVID-19 open data working group, shout out to them. And so we're generating a story about vaccinations for each province that includes, uh, you know, their, their data, how many vaccinations have been delivered, how many have been administered, the total number of usage in the province. And uh, like I said, we generate it in French also, and we're actually generating in French, we're not translating it. So there's a whole another system of logic that we had to build in to write stories in French, um, which, you know, I haven't spoken French since high school, so let's just say it's been it's been a trip. Um, so how this works, because I'm sure there, that's the big question now. It's it's not super complicated. Um, we bring in the data that we're using, so we have the APIs that we connect to to bring in the data that we need, and we run it through a series of functions for each province. So the first part is to sort the data into how we need it, and then to do math on the data to determine rates, Lucas, and then to look at the logic. So if we want to say something went up, you know, we would compare two numbers together. Lucas, if we wanted to say question. down, we'd compare those two same numbers, and we would need to define a case for when the numbers go up, when the numbers go down, and when the numbers stayed even. And then you basically need to do that for every time you're going to do a comparison or every time you're going to use a number. This is when it starts to get a little complicated. Um, there's always edge cases and then maintaining CP style, especially when it comes to numbers. So if there's zeros, do we, you know, you put a digit zero, do you write the word zero or would you change the sentence to say none to make it sound, you know, not so robotic written? Um, so it starts to get a little complicated there. What those functions do is they all output a string. So it takes the, the text that we had, it converts it, it changes, you know, the numbers, the text, whatever, and it puts it into a string. Those strings get all concatenated together and it runs through a loop through all the provinces to come, with, come out with one big string. Um, and then that big string is just projected into this text box here. Uh, and I'm just going to refresh this page just to show you how fast it works. So in that time, it connected to the API, it downloaded all the data, it ran all the logic on the data, it wrote the story, and then it pasted that into the box in less than a second and a half or two seconds. Um, just in terms of, you know, hours that we save reporters work here, it's in the hundreds, if not thousands by now. This is something somebody was doing two or three times a day, every day for the past year, pretty much. Well, almost, I guess 11 months, however long it's been. Oh, sorry, Lucas, just wanted to cut you off there for a sec. Can you make your screen a little bigger? And Asim, could you just uh, re unmute him? I seem to have lost the ability to let him, oh, there you go, thank you. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. I didn't realize it was so small, but yes, this is, uh, these are the stories that we are generating. I'll show you the first one um, up here. Again, these numbers aren't going to be correct because all the numbers haven't come in for the day. Um, but you can look, let's go down to Ontario. This many confirmed cases, active results, total number of deaths, however many new cases per day, new deaths reported, how many tests have been completed. Um, and it does that for all the provinces. And then uh, I think we also note that there were some repatriated travelers right back at the beginning. I think that's right up at the top when we look at the national numbers. Um, like I said, we moved to a new content management system so we can actually include some HTML tagging in this. So, you know, we, this will bold this year. This is superscript to make, you know, the asterisk small at the top, that type of thing. 
Uh, the vaccination stories, like I said, we're using the uh, the COVID working group data and um, the same sort of thing. New Brunswick, how many new vaccinations administered over the past week? How many doses given? And this is, again, where you get into these sort of complications. Um, what does inoculated mean? So we had, you know, a debate. Uh, does that mean someone's got both their doses or does that mean someone's only got one of the two doses? We couldn't say someone was fully vaccinated or vaccinated at all if they'd only got one of the two doses when we were considering both doses to be vaccinated. So, you know, it's not just computer stuff that goes into this. There's There was a lot of discussions too on the editorial level about what exactly we can say and, and what we can't say and then dealing with uh, CP style. So, you know, even if you want to learn to be like a computer geek or whatever we're calling ourselves these days, learn your CP style. It's still, it's still very important. Um, and then doing it in French, which was, this is still work in progress. We haven't actually launched this yet. I think we're launching it this weekend is the plan or the start of next week. So you're getting a, a sneak preview, but I work with our French service to, to sort of come up with this. And like I said, uh, this isn't translated. The first time we went through it, we took the story, we ran it through a translation tool to see what it looked like, and it needed some obvious work. So I've been working with, uh, you know, some people in uh, Soviet Francais to, to come up with the right words and how to deal with this. And this is where, you know, testing comes in because now I have to give them a test of all the different possible outcomes so they can see what the text looks like every time. And it's, uh, you know, it is, it is a lot of work. I think uh, most of the work we do isn't so much building things, it's testing them once they're built to make sure that they, uh, they actually work. Um, as for the charts, we'll go down here and take a look. Like I said, they were done in D3JS, which is just basically a, Javis a JavaScript library for manipulating uh, SVGs, scalable vector graphics. So anything that you see here that looks like a chart is just uh, an SVG. That means no matter how big or small you make it, it, it maintains fidelity all the way through. And uh, they're just inside uh, an HTML div. So this white area, this box would be a single div. These elements here would be HTML elements. So that's like an H2, an H3, the just paragraph text. And what we do is basically uh, you take a screenshot, but just of that div and turn it into uh, a blob is what it call, is, it's called, and then use uh, JavaScript to download the blob as a PNG. So when it downloads, um, you just click on it. I guess you can't see that because it's not on the screen, but it saves it as a PNG image, which is ready to go right onto the newswire or onto a website or wherever you need it to go. Uh, we were doing a newsletter for a while. That's where these charts ended up. And we could save them as PDFs too. We do that for some other things, but for this, we just needed PNGs. Um, so yeah, the how it works, like I said, this is kind of what the code looks like for just a screenshot just of one of the charts. Uh, it, it's complicated, but it's, you know, you could figure it out. Um, yeah, so this wasn't one of our bigger or more complicated projects that we've taken on for automation, uh, but it saved hundreds of hours. It's had a, a major impact. Uh, it gets used multiple times a day. These stories go out on the wire. It saved people a ton of time and it's made things, you know, more accurate. We've eliminated the potential for human error here everywhere except for the, uh, you know, for the, the data. And there's not much, unfortunately, that we can do about that. If, you know, the data is wrong at the source, it's wrong at the source. Um, and our clients really enjoy it too. You know, if it doesn't show up on time, they start asking where it is, what, uh, you know, what happened. Basically, this is the sort of thing that, that my group is looking to do, um, you know, at a larger scale, but we're, we're happy to help out with this. And it really does, free up our reporters to do other things, which is really the, the whole point of this. Um, in terms of looking to the future, you know, we don't have any other major plans on this right now. We'll have to see how, how the pandemic goes, but uh, getting things up and running in French was, you know, was a big challenge for us. And we're, we're really looking forward to being able to offer that to our French clients as well. And that's that's sort of where we're at right now. Um, so thanks for, for listening and, and checking out what we're doing. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, Happy to try to answer them. So yeah, we have uh, Mike Stucka, a friend of Canadians and data journalists everywhere, uh, asks, did you find any useful ways to anticipate your edge cases? He keeps getting bitten. 
uh, we would do brainstorming sessions on these sorts of things um, and learning from from past mistakes. Uh, one example I love is we, we've built a, a tool to do uh, market. It's like a market watch tool. Every hour it'll generate a story based on how things are going in the markets and it includes oil futures. And so we built this tool. We thought we were really smart. It looked really good. We did a lot of testing. And then one day, a few months ago, you might remember the price of oil went negative. We had never considered that the price of oil would go negative. And all of a sudden it's panicking. Oh, you know, oh no, what are we going to do? Luckily, uh, we were able to deal with it. So I think for, for edge cases, it's just, it's basically, you have to, you have to anticipate everything, any any possible permutation of the data that you get. So we always check for zeros. Now we always check for negative numbers, even if we don't anticipate them to be negative. And we always check against uh, not having data, you know, nulls, what happens then? Because if say one province isn't reporting, we don't want the whole thing to fail. We would just like that one part to not work. Great, and we have um, another question uh, from Anonymous. Are you drawing um, from multiple data sets? So for example, national and local level data? Um, right now we're using two data sets. The first one is the uh, the federal data uh, that I showed you here. Um, and this is what generates the first story and powers the charts. Um, we do manipulate it quite a bit to, to get it into the format that we need to use. The second set of data comes from the COVID-19 Open Working Data Group, which you can find on GitHub, um, and they have all the vaccination data that we're using. Uh, they also collate the other the other COVID data, but we've been using the the federal data, you know, since we've been able to, and we'd like to stick stick with that. It's also, you know, just in case there are, there are problems with one data source, at least we would have the other, not to put all of our eggs into to one basket. Great. And uh, now we have, I'm just going to send you live here. Uh, we have Adil asking, uh, are you planning to try any uh, natural language processing techniques for, for text generation to make it sound more human? Not at the uh, not at the current moment, not for this project. No, um, that is something that we've looked at for some for some other projects. For this, it's you know it's really basic. It's not narrative. It's very sort of basic information, and we find that a lot of our clients use it mostly to augment what they're doing or like radio broadcasters, so they'll have the numbers. So there hasn't been a lot of I guess pressure or you know any ideas towards trying to make it sound uh, more human humanish. But we also really like the fact that it's, you know, that it's standard and it's been standardized. Um, for some other projects that we're working on, that has been consideration, and we're looking into uh, a lot of NLP stuff now, especially with uh, Amazon, um, you know, with Comprehend, uh, Textract, that type of stuff. Great. So, I think. Uh, oh, we have another question. Uh, can this be used by journalists to report the COVID cases in their countries? Uh, this is Canada only just because it's based on the Canadian data and it's sort of bespoke to the Canadian data itself. The idea itself is absolutely, you know, you should, you can build something like this. Um, it doesn't have to be super complicated, even if you just want one line about what's going on in your, in your country, find the data source. I mean, there's, there's lots of data sources out there and, and you can build the sort of thing. It's just concatenation of strings and then going through and making sure that you have the numbers correct. Great, and uh, now we have, yeah, Jesse uh, asks, do you have any guidelines you follow for developing charts for mobile versus desktop? Uh, we, do, we do, it's been a while since I've done that. So the, we have another guy who works on our staff, Sean Vogie, who, who develops our charts. Um, he basically, he gives us what the templates, what the charts want to look like and, and how they'll work, and we sort of fill them out to do that. We also have a, another member of my staff, Mahima, who built one of the charts. Um, I haven't looked at those in a, in a long time, to tell you the truth. Uh, Sean would be the right guy, <laughs> right guy to ask about that. I've been more sort of focused on the, the automation point. We do have a big library, though, of charts that, that we built uh, a while back using D3 that are designed to be completely uh, responsive. So they work, you know, throughout the different screen sizes. They work on mobile. 
And uh, these charts, I believe, are based based on those. Great. And also, I just wanted to add that uh, tomorrow you can actually maybe ask Ms. Mahima that question, but she will also be presenting. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, one and then another question is, do you have examples of how you built your SVG samples as shown? Uh, not ones that I'm allowed to share, unfortunately. Um, you know, if you go to the, the D3JS website, uh, and it's, I'm sorry, it's a little confusing. We're not the same D3 as that. It's just, I didn't pick the name. It just got to sort of, you know, happen. But there's D3JS. If you go to their website, they have a lot of really great examples of how you can uh, build those sorts of charts. And they're easy to follow. It does get a little complex if you're not really familiar with, you know, SVG or JavaScript. It, it would probably be a, a big lift, but um, they're set up to use CSVs or JSON, any type of structured data that you have, you can turn into almost any type of chart using that library. Great. Well, I think, uh, yeah, if there's no other uh, questions right now, I'm going to say thanks a lot, Lucas. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and uh, we'll uh, be back uh, shortly. Just remember, I posted in the chat earlier that you might have to refresh your browser or app uh, when you come back just because we noticed a little bit of hiccups with Teams. So uh, I'll, I'll give everyone a cue in the chat when we're live. So uh, thanks and see you guys at, and guys and gals and everyone else at 2.45 p.m. Eastern. Thanks. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Data Driven 2021. Up next, we have Declan Co. I should have probably asked you how to pronounce it before. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. De Declan Co. is joining us from the Investigative Journalism uh, Bureau. A little bit about Declan. As I just pull up my show notes here, Declan is. An award-winning investigative reporter who has appeared in a number of publications, including the CBC Global News, National Observer, Now Magazine, and Toronto Star. And uh, he is the senior reporter at the Investigative Journalism Bureau at the University of Toronto. Uh, welcome, Declan. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. All right. Uh, so. Um, so I'm going to start. I am not uh, very well versed at presenting, so bear with me. Uh, but we thought it would be interesting to kind of talk about how we do things at the IJB when it comes to some of the ways we can get data and uh, share some of our insights and uh, philosophies. So the Investigative Journalism Bureau where I work, uh, we're a brand new uh, nonprofit newsroom based at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And we, we work collaboratively with uh, you know, universities and media organizations, uh, academics, um, research firms, and we do in-depth, uh, deeply reported stories of, you know, vital public interest. And while we do it, we also train uh, students, either journalism students or medical students, uh, whomever is interested in, in the programs, uh, how to do investigative journalism. Um, this came uh, about after a year of, or sorry, a decade of um, experimenting by Robert Cribb, who is the founder and director of the IJB uh, and also a reporter at the Toronto Star. And uh, now we are institutionalized and um, we have just published our inaugural series, which we will use as our case studies. Don't need that. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, collaborative partnerships and, and how they help us do more ambitious projects. Um, something that we, you know, maybe is a bit counterintuitive uh, to some degree, but negotiating for access to data rather than fighting long FY battles or uh, waiting for someone to slip something in a brown envelope for you. And then we're going to talk about just uh, creating unique data sets and databases uh, with academics and research firms for the purposes of publishing in the newspaper or in a, in a broadcast or wherever. 
Uh, and to do this, we're going to use our inaugural series, Generation Distress, uh, which started publishing in November in the Toronto Star and National Observer, a few university publications, and uh, was a year long, just over a year long project, which involved 70 researchers from 10 uh, universities across Canada and the United States, the Star, NBC News, National Observer, and it is based upon um, thousands of documents, as well as mental health data from 40 universities and colleges. Um, and the students in, in uh, concert with reporters were able to conduct uh, 152, or sorry, interviewed and surveyed 152 post-secondary students in Canada and the US who had identified as having some type of mental health challenge. And we also, in collaboration with a large international research firm, were able to conduct a public opinion survey of 6,000 post-secondary students across Canada and the US, which started before COVID and went well into the second wave. So it gave uh, unique insights into the you know, uh, uh, impact that the pandemic has had on youth mental health. Uh, to date, there's been 13 stories um, exploring everything from spiking demands on youth mental health from uh, post-secondary student or post-secondary institutions to uh, K to 12. And, you know, we're still publishing. There's a, there's a lot more to come. It's quite an ambitious uh, project that we're very proud of. So, um, talk about ambitious projects and unique data sets. Uh, like I mentioned, there was 152 um, uh, students who were surveyed. You can see on the right here, uh, this is just a couple of the data points, um, but you can see uh, a lot of, you know, pretty serious uh, afflictions that these uh, young people are going through. And, this one was really driven in part by the the work of student journalists, um, you know, troving through or uh, posting a lot on social media, through friend groups, um, uh, advocacy groups, etc., to find people who were willing to talk, and it it became a centerpiece of uh, every nearly every story. I think um, each question was designed in a way to to basically be its own kind of story. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, surveys are a great way to do novel research and collect your own data and uh, do something that's new and exciting and uh, get it, get it um, issues and questions that maybe uh, are harder to get. And I should say as well, if there are questions, please interrupt me. I uh, can ramble and get fairly monotone. I'll try not to. Uh, this is just, I made a little screen grab video for you, but um, we also did a survey of universities across Canada and or universities and colleges, and this took a year. Like it was just excruciating, you know, some we had to file FOIs, some they would answer questions. Uh, it would take months uh, back and forth. It was expensive. It was like pulling teeth and then going through and fact checking everything, going back to everyone and saying, this is what you told us. This is accurate. Uh, this is what we're going to publish. And because we put every every school in the, the database, we had to go back to them, obviously, and tell them what we were going to put up, put out to the public. And, you know, it took months, months and months and months. But it was worthwhile. Uh, it was ambitious, and it 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 you know shows. Uh, we think it's probably the most thorough and in-depth survey of ment youth mental health issues in post-secondary institutions. And um, we weighted it against uh, enrollment data, so that you know, because one of the questions is, well, maybe there's just more kids. But uh, the proportions and the ratios were still showing like spiking and explosive demands. So uh, that was one of the other data sets we built all together. They make the uh, generation distress, um, you know, for four big databases we have. 
One of them came from collaborating with researchers. So this is a private or I guess a public, publicly traded company, uh, Rewe, who specializes in, um, they call it quiet voices, you know, people that you may not get in uh, phone surveys or, you know, ledger web surveys or what have you. Uh, they have a whole super interesting process, which I am not uh, really able to uh, describe, but they use um, old URLs and, and drive people. I don't know. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. They have a whole algorithm that's proprietary. It's worth looking into. I can provide some resources if anyone is interested. But uh, the main thing here is that it was, you know, these, these are expensive things to do. They ran a survey for eight months. I think they had originally gotten like 60,000 respondents, but you know, once you get it down to the to the usable st uh, ones, it ended at about 6,000. So, you know, that was from one doing the legwork before and, and having this ambitious project and then approaching people who have expertise and specialties which are far beyond their capabilities and really you know, making the pitch that uh, they can contribute to something, something great, and it worked, and it was great, and uh, they've published their own kind of uh, eggheady, not journalistic reports. You know, like the academic um, data analysis and stuff, uh, and they're also working with a number of universities who are now using the data that they collected to produce other peer-reviewed studies and reports. Exactly. So, so I had a question there. So what do you think that this is then, how did you maintain kind of that editorial like barrier between like, you know, you're obviously working with, with uh, academics and then you're uh, doing the reporting as well. I mean, how, how is, I mean, just maintaining that relationship and, and do you think that this is like a, a good way to go forward with, with times of collaboration, like working with, with kind of outside research partners like this? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was, we, 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 we made the questions together, but they were largely our, our, our lines of inquiry. Um, and there was no we were completely editorially independent as are they. So it worked great because, you know, we get, what we need, they get what they need. They get to publish their things. We get to publish our things, and it's just kind of like a, uh, and I, I guess we we published way before them, anyways. But you know, a, an agreement to publish at the same time, and it worked fantastically. Um, they were happy. We were happy. The data is, you know, from like so from what we can tell, the way that they did it, you know, this is one of the largest surveys, but especially of of uh, you know the different elements uh, around like ethnicity and race. Um, there's a lot of variant uh, variation and a lot of analysis to be done um, as well as, uh, you know, genders and gender diversity. A lot of that was captured in the survey. So in some in some regards, it's quite. It's quite unique, I think, um, in, in its scope and its breadth and, and what it's able to say and what we're able to report and and use you know so we can go to the experts and say we have this massive survey that was done very technically you know sometimes when you do a survey as a journalist you're not thinking about margins of error you're not thinking about um how you're approaching people and it's just kind of like throwing like i don't know sand in a sandbox uh to use a made-up analogy um but this is what they do. They live and breathe this, right? So it was bulletproof and they have their own dashboards that we can use to analyze it. We can download it. We can analyze it ourselves. And uh, I, I, th I think it's great personally uh, collaborating with academics and researchers like this. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can't see the chat or anything. I don't know if there's any questions, but I'll just keep going. Um, so negotiating as well, uh, one of our favorite things to do is just make the pitch to people who are the gatekeepers of information to give it to us. Uh, and this came up with uh, um, a CAMH report that we had got wind of basically right on right in our wheelhouse of this series. It was going to publish right around the same time, maybe before, which would take some of the steam out of the, the reports that we were doing and, and the 
the splash that we wanted to make. So, you know, uh, Rob went to them and he made the pitch. You know, look at all these, look at all this research we've done. We've just spent a year doing this. There's no point in in not letting us report on this first. Like, let's come to uh, an agreement, um, give it to us an embargo, and then we will we will publish, and then you can publish, and and your report will get a a lot of play on the front page, and it will be one of the main centerpieces of this series. And the CAMH is a massive research institution. They have their own publishing schedules and it was not looking like it was going to happen and then and then you know someone 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 took on the the fight within and uh, they agreed and and they changed their publishing schedules and it became one of the you know the it came became the news hook of the series right so that it's not you know it's not like on international day or like bell let's talk day for example which is today um Rather than jumping on that, you know, we're able to create our own news hook through negotiating. And this is something that we are doing with other projects that we're working on, where rather than fighting to get the data, we work uh, to, to come to some type of agreement, um, which helps because, you know, then you can go back, it's something you don't understand. It's, it's easy to get someone on the phone and say, what, what did you guys do here? I'm not understanding this. Or, you know how is how is this framed in your report? This doesn't make sense to me, etc. So it, I we we think um, it helps the reporting, uh, and it helps us understand it better, which then helps us write better and and relay it to the public better. So uh, this I think this is my last slide. Um, yes, but I mean I know. It seems kind of counterintuitive, I guess, um, especially when you're working with like, I don't know, a, a government or something, but it it helps. I mean, if you can get the the people at you know, Stat Statistics Canada on your side and they start doing um, custom tables and they're not charging you and you go back and forth uh, with questions and they give you answers. I mean, it's just it's so much easier, so simple <laughs> when you get past the barrier of uh, getting in the door. Uh, what was it like uh, doing a report like this, uh, specifically a generation distress one? I, I assume you know you you were uh, querying your own employer in a sense because U of T obviously you're, you're based out of U of T and obviously uh, University of Toronto is one of the largest uh, post secondary institutions in uh, the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, probably has their fair share of, of people in mental distress, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, that was something we were, it's interesting. So to give you the, the end of the story first, nothing happened. There was no uh, pushback. There was no, uh, they weren't, they weren't breathing down our necks or anything. We had complete editorial control and independence, but it was interesting because, you know, there was like four, three, three stories where U of T is not the bad guy, but like the, the some serious out allegations were reporting on human rights um, uh, uh, complaints and, and court cases and, and, and all that. And we we're like, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look great on us. Just like, you know, we're rocking the boat pretty hard here, but it, it was fine, you know. Um, it was just like approaching any, any source for accountability. Um, you know, they weren't like, hey, what are you doing? Like, you're part of this. Uh, institution so <laughs> why don't you go look at queens or U ubc or something it was it was fine and it's good because it would kind of undermine the whole initiative if if there was an issue like that it would have kind of hamstrung us before we even left the finish line or the starting line so if uh tell me about how many tell me about your partners because you weren't if, if i recall you you weren't just working obviously with the toronto star who are some of your other uh media partners there and how did that collaboration work uh so the other main one uh would be nbc who has not published yet um and they i mean they, they were doing the states obviously um a lot of the universities and the students are from the states so they were they were looking at similar issues but in the states hasn't published yet so i don't uh the other one 
National Observer, and they, you know, we, we gave them the SCED, they went through it, and they went through the, the kind of the topics that we had had started looking at that fit into their, uh, you know, their wheelhouse and, and what their audiences are interested in. We ended up publishing a good story about climate anxiety, and that all came from the surveys uh, that we had done, which was, was one of the most common um, things that the youth had um, uh, indicated as like a key stressor for them. So climate change, accident, existential threat, do they even, is there even a future? Why am I in university? Those kinds of things. So that was, uh, that was where they wanted to publish and, and we just kind of showed them all the research, which had come from, you know, 70 students as well as like grad students doing literature reviews on every, every topic that we wanted. Uh, databases of court cases and academic journals. It was just uh, a mess of spreadsheets and PDF files. Um, I still can't see the chat. Is there any questions? I don't even know what time it is. At the moment, you still got a few more uh, minutes here, though. So, um, what else? I mean, if there's questions, it would make this easier. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to have a question. Right now, yeah. Uh, so we have people just like uh, popping in, you know, in and out of the chat. Yeah, but yeah, we'll, we'll take questions. I mean, if not, I, I, have, I have a few more. Um, yeah. I mean, what was kind of, uh, what was your big kind of, uh, was, was there any particular challenge that you faced in, in doing this, in, in doing this kind of large scale? And, you know, uh, investigation across multiple publications and schools and anything, any like really big quick takeaways you can give to people that are thinking about taking on an investigation of this scale? Yeah, I mean, there's always problems. Um, but I think what helped was just having clearly defined uh, goals and, and research um, plans. Uh, you know, you, you can make a survey and as you start doing a survey, uh, it gets longer and longer and longer, which is why the one that we did on our own was 40 questions, whereas the one that we did with Riwi was much shorter and that was by design because we knew, you know, the likelihood of people going through those questions without someone sitting there and interviewing them was, was slim. Um, you know, making a survey of any institution is is just it's like almost it's, it's it's like a fool's game you know like you're just you're in it for the long haul you're not going to get anything substantive unless you spend six months on it because that's just how long it takes to get 40 different pr uh policies and and people and running up each of their own ladders uh so <laughs> there's, there's no advice there other than know what you're getting into. But I will say, I mean, you know, this was a very data driven story, but obviously it, it's not about that. It's about kids and, and uh, adults who are facing unprecedented challenges with their mental health. And, and I know, especially with, you know, students who are so involved in this, it it's tricky, right, not to um, reduce it to numbers because it, it's not that these are people's lives and I think that was another exercise right is just not just reporting on uh, you know a survey because that would like that's the backbone but nobody cares about numbers it was the human stories and the characters and and the the hardship and the drama that were the real heartbeat of of the series and I guess if there's this is one other thing that I hope you take away other than all of what my slides say is just that data is not it's very rarely what's gonna what's gonna hook people in my mind that it, it's it's w what happens with the data it's the people's lives it's their it's their especially with this one you know it's just so rich and speaking of people uh, we have a question uh, how did you get the survey out to people which one? So that well, I'll just I'll just answer for all of them. 
this uh, the one that we did the 152 that was you know social social media uh, call outs essentially and then these were these were done in an interview it's just a structured 40 question thing we asked everyone the same questions and um, this re we one they have like I said they have their own uh, proprietary system um, I was considering uh, making some notes on it, but I was just like, this is, I, I won't be able to properly explain it. Uh, but they have a proprietary system where they, they, they use old domain names on the internet and it's anonymous. It's, it's different than like a, a, a call list survey. It's, I don't, I don't really understand it to be honest. It's quite, quite cool and confusing. Yeah, no problem. The, uh, we, we do have another question actually. Yeah, the, uh, the question is the time you spent working on a pitch and negotiating with these institutions, how much time were you able to save compared to just filing an FOI from being able to, to go just kind of directly to certain institutions? Well, with this one, we wouldn't be able to file. This wouldn't be an FOI. We would just, it's a public, it was going to be public anyways. Uh, it would just come out and then everyone else would report on it and, and then it would, you know, we wouldn't have the, the exclusive, if you will. But, with other other institutions, I mean, it's maybe not a time saver. Sometimes it is. It depends who they are. It depends on your relationship, if they like you, uh, what you're asking for. Obviously, uh, we're do we're doing a lot of we're at a public health school. We do a lot of public health uh, reporting that's clearly in the public interest. So there's less pushback than like if I was trying to get I don't know contracts or you know things that maybe not maybe a bit more sensitive but it can take a long time there's no there's no uh sugar coating it it can take months but uh when you do it you're able one to go back to them on the data and say this is how we're looking at it this is what we're going to report like what do you you know what do you think or how did you get this number how did you do that how did you do this and you can also go back to them in the future uh, and you know you get on the the rolodex and they start letting you know when something worthwhile is coming up it's just uh you know when you're doing public interest public health stories uh, which we do a lot of it's it's just uh works for us and i think it would work for a lot more people if uh if they tried <laughs> i know i never tried that I never tried the approach before. It's it's definitely a, a crib uh, from from what I've learned uh, from him. And it, it's a good one. It works. Were there, um, thanks for that. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, were there any issues getting, a far, getting far enough in terms of the survey? Like uh, this person says, I'm assuming it was distributed on social media by UNT members. Did you ever worry that maybe there weren't that there were important voices that you weren't able to reach? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, at the beginning, it was definitely skewing like the one that we did, um, uh, the forty question survey. Uh, that one was definitely skewing white, and it was something. It was it was something that we recognized and and actively tried to uh, correct. And we did that by going to different groups and uh, different advocacy groups and saying this is a survey, you know, do you know anybody who would be interested? It it was just it was just a matter of doing more call outs really and 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 putting in the effort to accurately try and convey uh, the population and not just a sub subsect of it. We were also uh, worried about not having enough <laughs> people and there was a real push at the end uh, to get up to over 150 and uh, we we barely made it, but we did. So out of the 150, I mean, how many calls out, I guess, did you have to, how many, how many, how many hooks do you think you had to send out in order to get 150 pe odd people to respond to you? Hundreds. Hundreds, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's like you know, it's like any other any other endeavor. You know, put out ten, hope for one. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of it too. A lot of it was you know, university students. So 
once one person shares it and everyone they know shares it and it, it goes it goes pretty quickly through the through the uh, line of communication. Did you have a number that you were aiming for? Like was 150 the number that you wanted or was there an ideally a, a higher number that you wanted? Well, it was it was like chunks like we didn't want to end it like uh, 99 or 104. It was, you know, we got to 75 and then it's like, all right, let's see if we can do 100, 125, 150. I mean, obviously we would have loved to get as high as we could, but at some point you just got to just got to call it quits because it could go on forever. We could still be doing it and we'd still be learning and it would still be worthwhile, but you know, we can't can't spend all our time on one thing forever. Great. Well, I think we're just about uh, out of time. I was going to say, is there anything uh, you want to plug that IJB might be working on in the future or or how people can get in touch with you or the, if they want to work with the IJB? Yeah, uh, we're always working on things um, and we're always looking to work with other media organizations or uh, researchers, universities, J schools, uh, we're always open. We're open and uh, we're all ears. You can reach me at this email uh, or on our website, which I don't have here because I'm a goofball, but I will put it in the chat. It's just ijb.utoronto.ca. All right. Well, great. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Declan. And uh, thanks. And we have one more panel panel coming up uh, with Clara Fiseca at uh, 3.40, sorry, at, at 3.30. So uh, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back for the uh, final panel of day one of Data Driven 2021. That's a lot to say uh, pretty soon. So thanks. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to Data Driven 2021. Uh, I'm here for the uh, final panel of the day with uh, Clara Faseca. I hope I, she sent me how to pronounce it and I hope I got at least seven out of 10. Uh, and so uh, she is here to talk to us about how she uses what she calls junior data journalism. A bit about Clara, uh, she's a journalist currently living and working in New Brunswick uh, for one of the largest newspapers in the province, the Times and Transcript. And uh, she holds a master's in public policy, public administration from New York Osgood, Bachelor of Arts in Theater and Political Science from the University of Toronto, and is an al alumni of the Fellowship in Global Journalism at the University of Toronto. She ha also has held over 70 jobs in various industries, so I'm not gonna list them all here. But uh, welcome, Clara. Thanks so much for having me, David, and uh, thanks everyone for, for checking out uh, the conference and uh, sticking it out for the last panel of the day. Really appreciate that. So um, as David mentioned, um, I write for the Times and Transcript and sometimes a Telegraph Journal, two papers uh, in the same chain. And it's under a program called the, the Local Journalism Initiative, which is a, a federal program that I believe um, helped 99 journalists get jobs across the country. Um, and we really focus on uh, those locations that are considered news deserts. Um, so Southeast New Brunswick is one of those, and that's uh, where I live. So uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, what capacity I'd be able to have to use uh, data journalism. I do work in daily news and uh, the average length of time that I get to write a story is actually about four and a half hours. Um, and ideally I write two, occasionally three stories in a day. So some of you who, you know, do a little bit uh, more in-depth data journalism might be listening to this being like, I don't even know how she has time to do data journalism. Um, and if you're thinking of it in the traditional sense and uh, you'd largely be right, I don't have a lot of time to be uh, spinning around writing uh, on Excel sheets for several days at a time on one story. Uh, but I do really care about using uh, data journalism. I found my own kind of way to, to go about it, to center data in my stories. And I call that uh, junior data journalism, which is a term that I've made up. So if you just go um, saying that in newsrooms, acting like it's a real thing, um, don't maybe do that. So I'm going to share um, some slides that I've prepared. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some, some tips um, through some examples of how I've been able to use uh, these techniques in this way and hopefully it helps you. 
Um, you know, maybe you are in a regional uh, newsroom or daily news and you're, you know, you really love data, you're looking to use it a little bit more. Maybe you have just starting in the field or maybe you've been in it for a while and uh, these are just kind of some go to tips that you can go to when you're stuck for coming up with a pitch, um, you know, in the grind of daily news, especially at this time, there's a lot of pitch fatigue and these kind of tips and go to techniques have uh, helped me and hopefully they'll help you. Okay, here we go. Go like this. Go like this. Perfect. So, uh, oh, we don't we don't uh, see it. You might have to remember to share your whole screen and close all your confidential information. You did it right before, just not. Okay. Okay. okay let's see. Let's see if I just didn't uh, do it right here. Uh oh. Okay, I see it gave me a different pop up. Here we go. Can you see it now? Perfect. Perfect. Alrighty. Um, so this is my Twitter handle. If anyone feels like uh, tweeting at me at any point or if you just want to uh, DM me to ask me some more questions afterwards, uh, if you're too shy to post them in the chat. Um, yeah, so this is why I think that junior data journalism is great, because if you're competing in daily regional news market, chances are using data will give you stories that your competitors and your colleagues don't have. And everyone thinks actually that they don't have time to use data in daily news uh, when there's under so much pressure. But I found that the opposite is true with junior data journalism. And these stories are going to actually, these techniques are going to save you time in daily news pitching, which as I mentioned at times can be uh, quite tiring. But what is it exactly? So as I mentioned, it's not an official term. It's basically when you use data that's fast, that's often readily available, you may need to ask for it, uh, but it's data that should be pretty accessible to your sources. Um, and it also might be things that, you know, that might come in appendixes and various things that we don't always uh, dive right to the end of a report or different things like that, that you'll find it there. So this is kind of data journalism, junior data journalism, I kind of like it's never never uses an FOI. You can kind of think of it like that too, but it still centers data in your stories. So here are some tips and examples. OK, so this is my first tip. It's that if the government doesn't give you what you want or gives you something incredibly vague and says they can't give out employee numbers or details like that, you should go to the local union rep. So often the main media person will be in Ottawa or Toronto and they most likely won't be able to give you what uh, you need data wise if you're reporting in various regions across the country, though they could. Though they could serve uh, other um, purposes, uh, such as giving you some umbrella information. OK, so here's what that looked like for me in this particular story. So in this first story that I'm going to, to share with you, I had a hunch that Atlantic Canadian correctional institutions um, were experiencing correctional officer shortage and it would be worse in a pandemic. So it turns out that I was right and I had a union rep pull me every leave. So that's when people go away outside of the workplace for various reasons, could be holiday, could be sick leave, could be a variety of things, and the numbers to determine just how bad this uh, shortage was. And then I had them explain their concerns in the story. So this is what that story uh, looked like. It ended up being at the bottom of uh, RA1 that day. Um, and I'm just going to read you just the first little, just going to kind of break down the first little piece. Um, you'll notice that in this story, I actually didn't start with the data, which is kind of a choice that I made because it was why this data was so significant in the quotes. I felt like he was giving me some baller quotes, so I actually led with those. Um, and the data that's quite in detail kind of comes later in the story. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated staffing shortages at Corrections Canada institutions in the Maritimes, says the union rep re representing the federal correctional officers. If we are short staffed, we all have to stay late. We can't just leave the doors closed and walk away, says Bev McKibben, the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers Atlantic Regional President. We have to be there. And that means a reduction in turnaround times between shifts and an increase in worker fatigue, which can decrease sharpness on the job, McKibben said. If you're not sharp and you're working in a prison, that's dangerous, he said. We carry firearms, just not looking what prisoners are up to because they're tired. They're real dangers that come with our work. He continues to talk more about uh, staffing shortages, uh, mental health, um, 
sort of breaking point that officers can go through. And it's actually only halfway through the story that I begin to sort of share the data um, of how many sort of officers were on leave. And you can kind of see here that it's, you know, 145 of 230 at Atlantic Institution, for instance. So the numbers were pretty striking. Um, and it was really, really interesting to be able to share this uh, with readers. And it actually also gave me a follow story because um, we had pulled correctional officers as well to uh, the border in New Brunswick. And that was a problem uh, as well and exasperated this even further. So that's sort of one, one example. So that's kind of how to use um, unions who want to get data out um, and they might help your story by giving you very, very specific data. And if no one else is sort of looking for that particular thing, you have a very original story. And also nobody can find these specific things that might be your competitors without asking that question. It's not just sitting in a report. So you get to have kind of a, an original story because they can't re-report those numbers just because you had them without going to a source to get them. So uh, yeah, that's tip number one. Tip number, tip number two is for turning anecdotal leading daily news that, d d d d sorry, turning anecdotal leaning stories that I find that daily news really thrives off of into data stories. So um, this is what I mean by this is you might uh, be asked by an editor, they might sort of see, you know, a couple people might have been posting different things and someone kind of has a feeling, oh, I'm sure a lot of people are canceling their vacation during the pandemic because they've seen a couple people post that makes them think probably a lot of people are doing that and then they want a soft story about that. So what I've done with that is I've used polls and market research to support an assignment for that type of anecdotal story. Um, so if people sort of are behaving sort of certain ways en masse, probably one of the big polling companies in the country has uh, conducted a poll about it, about behavior. And it's the same with, with market as well. Um, you can also use this technique of using this type of data when you have no pitches, your brain feels dead, you can kind of just go through some of the big polling companies polls for that week that they're released. And what you're going to do is you're going to look for what I call regional outlier responses. So, um, and then you're going to support that with a, a human face. So you might look at the charts um, and I have one on the next slide here. So I look at this chart here and I go to New Brunswick and I see which percentages are particularly high or particularly low. And then that can become the lead of a really quick story that I might be able to do. So for instance, one story I did, Atlantic Canadians were less able to identify the COVID symptoms than those living in any other region. So that's now a headline or a lead, a very sort of strong bang out the gate. And you might have you know more nuance, there might be more on par in certain other things to do with that um, story, but it's a lot more interesting than, you know, Manitobans are the most average respondents. You know, that's not, that's not a great lead. But if you just find one strong outlier, that could be the basis of your thing. And then you can look into it. And then you find people who are experiencing those things. You have your human face, ideally two or three human faces. Um, and then, you know, it's a story that can end up being on your A1. Uh, because unless, sure, there's been some exceptions during COVID, you know, you know what number deaths sort of had happened. But most of the time, a picture of a number is not going to lead your A1. But if you have that sort of human face, that's what you're kind of always looking for. Uh, but you're sort of starting in, in this way. Um, this particular chart was about um, what people were doing over Christmas. This was a poll by Cardis and Angus Reid. And I was doing a story to see how many people, uh, whether people were going to church in person um, coming up to Christmas. Um, and this was before the pandemic, what did you do? And then I was able to sort of have a comparison to just say, well, normally in a year, you know, 39% of people would go to church and then in the next slide, how many didn't? And then you get, you know, the headline, like half of normal churchgoers say they're not in New Brunswick and that type of thing. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of examples. Uh, this is, you know, an example of a story that I did that was about Christmas, sorry, not, summer vacation, people changing their vacation plans, more people were camping in the province, got uh, several stories out of that one uh, about provincial park use, um, people buying trailers, a whole bunch of different uh, data points I was able to use to build multiple stories. But as you see, we have this uh, 
photo of this family having lots of fun, human faces, and uh, we were able to uh, lead with that photo. Okay, uh, so my next tip is about turning press releases into better stories. So if you work in daily news or if you're just looking through the various websites that show press releases, um, my tip is really just to read the whole report, especially the appendix. So there's someone who's written these reports, maybe they are a, a group working on uh, child poverty, maybe they are um, a group working on underfunding for any sort of particular thing. And the appendixes, when they talk about how the data that they have collected sort of for you, they sometimes make charts at the end that um, indicates where different uh, their the responses in sort of different regions. So that's what I found um, in this case. But when you get a report like this, know that a lot of people are getting that at the same time. So my tip as well, especially when you're you know, competing against others, even within your newsroom or um, in your sort of region, is to claim the report early and know that the first story that you get might need to be sort of an overview story that maybe everybody kind of has of kind of the biggest takeaways in the report. But then when you dive into the appendix is when you might be able to get a second or even a third story. So that's something that I was able to do here that I just kind of want to go into. Um, so here's that story. So this story is based on an umbrella report that was about child poverty that didn't really focus on um, the Indigenous issue at all. The way that I found this is through the appendix, they just looked at uh, each region um, community that they by by postal code and because I know the community that uh, I report on quite well I noticed that a couple of the names of indigenous communities were outliers much higher rate of child poverty um, and because of that uh, I started to kind of look then at all the indigenous communities and found that every single indigenous community in New Brunswick had a child poverty rate that was more than double um, all non-indigenous communities. So I thought that was pretty significant um, and was quite exciting that I was able to dive into it. And again, nobody else had this, uh, mostly because uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of time to read or think we don't have a lot of time to read appendixes and things like that. We kind of just scoop the sort of top headlines and write that first story. But uh, I was gifted with this. Um, and yeah, so I'm just gonna just share like a piece of it. So they'd included over 50 communities. And as I said, all these indigenous communities had a rate of 50% or higher, which was more than double the provincial average of 21.8. I was able to speak to several chiefs in this community. So 70% child poverty rate wasn't uncommon. Um, so I was able to speak to quite a lot of them. And one of the most fulfilling things actually about, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but one of the most fulfilling things about doing this story is that this data um, had not never been available before, equivalent data, and to be able to share that then uh, with the people that uh, you serve as, as a journalist, it's just my uh, belief, um, to be able to share that with them. And I was able to ask them what they sort of plan to do with it. And we also were able to talk about uh, gaps that existed of uh, data collection among certain communities. So they able to kind of go meta with it. If you ever expose data in some way through your journalism, obviously the person who wrote the initial report had exposed it as well. But if you're ever able to sort of bring light to data that hasn't kind of been written about before, um, I think it's really great to be able to talk to the communities about sort of what that kind of means to bring kind of significance to data. And I also just think it encourages uh, the world policymakers to put more data out there, which I think we all love as well as data journalists. So I think it helps everyone there. Um, and then, you know, then you have these, I discovered a lot of different different things sort of through it that they'd been kind of advocating for and got some follow stories out of that one as well. Um, so back to my presentation here. Where is it? Sorry, I temporarily lost it. Here we go. 
Yes. So, okay. And my last tip is a bit of a more fun one. This is about using data to get through dead news periods. So I really recommend that uh, you use data during these periods because only real people can ignore you and data will be there for you while everyone else is on Christmas vacation, but you aren't because you still print papers every day. Um, but I do suggest that uh, if you're gonna use data during these periods, still find some way to make it fun and relatable and don't uh, make it just completely um, a heavy kind of nerdy piece. So this is sort of a fun way that manifested for me this year. Um, so I decided to use um, data to estimate how much milk Santa would drink um, while flying over New Brunswick on Christmas Eve um, because we wanted some more kind of soft Christmas stories. Um, but I'm a nerd, so that's why I did this. So. Uh, just if anyone's interested, the upper estimate is over 50,000. Um, and I did this by looking at the number of people who celebrate Christmas in the province, um, the number of house, which was through a, a CARDIS um, poll. Then I looked at the number through Statistics Canada of households that had at least one child under 14. Um, I did assume that uh, and then I combine those those two together to to figure out uh, the the approximate number of um, people that celebrate Christmas that had a household of people under fourteen. Um, and then, of course, I brought the human face in. Um, you know, on various Facebook groups, I asked families if they were planning on leaving milk out if they had pictures of their kids, that type of thing. So then I got this, you know, these lovely, adorable tales, a lovely, adorable photo of a child with putting out milk from Santa for previous years. So you kind of got that that take that, uh, you know, was lovely for a paper to be able to sort of share on that day, but I got to kind of nerd out and kind of combine data in some some fun ways. So in summary, probably nobody's going to tell you don't put data in your story, but they might tell you uh, to put less data in. So just be prepared for that. This is just what you know, junior data journalism looks like for me. And I hope that some of you are able to use these tips. Maybe you hadn't thought of something before. Um, and you know, if you have other quick tr tricks, uh, feel free to send them to me um, anytime. I'd love to hear yours as well. Um, you can also go ahead and ignore all of the paths that I've taken and just uh, use it uh, in ways that are meaningful for you. Um, but uh, I just kind of wanted to, to share this to show that there's there's more than one way to use data in your story. Um, and you might be good at using it uh, in different ways, but it does make for, for richer stories that I think people do really appreciate in newsrooms, large or quite small. Thanks. Great, so yeah, so now, uh, thanks Clara. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, light up our Q&A. And or if or if Clara just did that expertly and uh, answered all of your questions within her presentation, that's fine too. But maybe go, while, while we're waiting to see people are forming some questions, tell me what was it like with some of the people that were was anyone else doing data journalism in your newsroom, Clara? And and what was the risk kind of the re, the reception like maybe at the yeah. beginning you started pitching data and then towards okay. now? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I recently was just snowshoeing with one of my colleagues and sort of mentioned that, you know, just something sort of about sort of using sort of polls in this way. And she said that they had never really done that um, before, which surprised me. Um, people had, you know, it's not like people never include any quantitative things, but people had definitely never used things to kind of beef up an anecdotal story, kind of. It was either we are going to find like how much this has increased or decreased. It's not like a stats can report had never made it into our reporting, but uh, the idea of, of beefing up any sort of anecdotal tales, like we would often, and we still do sometimes, we would often, you know, have a, a couple of people who are experiencing this and, you know, other people find the story sort of relatable, but it's not supported necessarily by by data in the, the journalism. So. I knew that I wasn't going to have a lot of time to work on a huge, big, long 
uh, kind of piece that sort of takes takes ages. I knew that that wasn't going to be how dad journalism would, would manifest in this particular role in my career. Um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of had to find find my own way with it. But now, you know, some of the stories have have done well um, and they've, you know, enhanced things like our, our business pages. And they're just something that I can I can turn to because we always want more and more content and you know places like polling and market research firms they actually give you various polls that you could be pulling from potentially if there was something of interest to your region every week so it's kind of data that's hoping you'll you'll use it so it's just kind of nice saying yes great so we have a question here uh from anonymous what are some of your go-to data resources go-to data resources um well, it depends what you mean by resources. For me, I would say for sure, as I mentioned, uh, polls and market research. Um, so like I'll go to the Leger polls, I'll go to the narrative research, does a lot of Atlantic Canada stuff. I'll go to um, Angus Reid. Um, sometimes Abacus Main Street's a little bit just specific to the political stuff. Those are who I'll sort of use the most in that front. And then, um, yeah, appendixes of reports, like any, you know, advocacy group, different things, groups talking about poverty or different things like that. Just go beyond the press release and read read the appendixes or different things like that. I found a lot of stories like that. Um, I don't use any particular tools to do uh, my work. I don't use any of the cool data apps, actually, um, which I'm not actually amazing at. So. It's a kind of adaptive method, but yeah. So, so what do you, uh, there's a few more questions I just want to ask, because what, what do you use then? What tools do you use? I assume you might use Excel or some sort of spreadsheet program. Uh, I use yeah. no spreadsheets. So no, I, I'm not very good at spreadsheets and the way that I use it, I, they hand me the data essentially. There are, they give you charts and I just kind of go like this with my finger. I scan and say like New Brunswick and I and I just like circle when it's like higher or lower even in my head or if I'm uh, have it sort of pasted down. So yeah, I'm not converting it into other stuff. I, I literally am using a pen and paper and when I go through a full, um, all the results of a poll, for instance, I'm just using that as an, as an example, I'm just writing down every outlier on a pen and paper. So it's a very unsophisticated method um, but every outlier, I just write it down. And then when I pitch in our meetings every morning, I lead with that, the, the, which outlier was the most uh, distinct. Okay, well, I, that surprised me. Uh, but great, that's good to know for anyone who's scared of using Excel, although you shouldn't be. Uh, next, uh, someone asks, uh, do you have any tips for not getting quote unquote lost in the sauce when you're working on a data story, uh, on a story that includes data? Huh. Um, I think if you focus a lot on, if you use the method of picking your biggest outlier as your anchor for your story, and you just like go back to like, that's what this story is about and just say to yourself, you know what? I could use multiple, um, I could, I could make multiple stories out of this. Like if you feel like, oh, there's just so much here, you should just say to yourself instead, like amazing. And then say to your editor, this is awesome. I think I could actually get two stories out of it. I mean, I have someone in my newsroom that's pitched like six stories on the same topic, basically, and they just keep getting sort of more out of it. So yeah, just turn it into a positive and just say, great, now I don't have to pitch a new thing in two days, I would say. Great, and we have another question, which is, um, how do you approach the collection of data from smaller, more private Indigenous communities while maintaining respect for their privacy and your role as an outsider? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I will say that I haven't collected the data myself. I've used data that's been collected for me through other organizations. But in speaking to them, um, I have now relationships with various um, Indigenous communities in Southeast New Brunswick. Um, I've attended their events. They held a, a small powwow um, in uh, Indian Island First Nation. I attended it. Uh, my car actually broke down outside in a rainstorm. Um, and uh, 
I didn't know anyone to call. It was pretty much the furthest I could be from any of our changed newsrooms in the province because I was right in between two jurisdictions. And I called the source. Um, I only knew two sources in the community. And then before I knew it, like everyone was coming to give my car a boost. Um, and I just keep asking Indigenous uh, indigenous sources that I have for, I don't ask them just for like, uh, oh, this scandalous story. I ask, I write about like very ordinary things that we would be writing about if Adorable Child in Moncton did this. Like I, I ask them for just sort of much smaller stories or, oh, I saw, you know, your business is pivoting this way in the pandemic, like tell me about that. So I just kind of form like real relationships in that way, I guess. And um, then when it is something that's maybe more contentious, people do kind of answer my call. I don't have relationships with every Indigenous group in, in the province, but in the couple that uh, I'm closer with, I've kind of spent time in the communities, given you know feedback on different things that they've they've done, trying to sort of attract uh, tourists, different things like that. I've kind of just like spent time and listened to those sort of stories. But yeah, I'm not collecting the data um, itself. But uh, I will say that when I did share that data that someone else had collected that I just kind of shared from their appendix, they were um, appreciative of, of having that and asking about what that sort of meant to them to have it um, seem to be a, a meaningful question. But yeah, that's a different challenge if you're collecting it, I guess. And I'll just jump in to say that if that is something that interests you, please tune in tomorrow for our second keynote, who is going to be directly addressing that topic, uh, Jimmy Thompson. So I uh, get the schedule on the uh, Humber Story Lab website uh, to see exactly when that is. I believe it's at 1 p.m. And uh, finally, we just got one time for one last question, which is uh, how do you validate your data? Uh, do you use only one source or do you, or do you compare do you compare your data, I guess, before using it? This is, I'm just reading the question here. I guess, how do you, how do you vet it? Do you, would you call people? Um, so, I mean, if I'm using a national poll, like I don't, I don't redo their poll. I do, but I do always uh, include a piece in every story um, that's, you know, about uh, this is accurate, this times out of whatever, which I don't need to calculate myself. It is uh, calculated. So I do always include the kind of accuracy line that is included with polling and research data. Um, I don't re I don't redo data from reports from sort of uh, poverty reports, for instance, like that. So I don't actually redo it. Um, I do always ask the communities that are affected, like, are you surprised by this? Is you know, I ask them if this is kind of what they were expecting. Um, thus far, they have said yes. Um, so. Yeah, in the type of data that I use, that's not a thing that's uh, come up yet in my work. But if I was just getting it casually from an individual that said, yeah, I'd say like, you know, half the the store, half the stores here have sold like double the amount. I wouldn't like I wouldn't consider that data journalism. We might still include a, a quote saying, you know, lots of people are saying they've sold, you know, they've sold the like, double like kind of more casually, but I wouldn't really count that as sort of data, I would say, just a kind of more casual quote. Right. Well, um, I'll also just say that you got some greetings from Manchester in the UK and that these were fantastic tips, both from, uh, oh yeah, uh, Megan says fantastic tips. So yeah, so with that, I think we will uh, conclude uh, data-driven uh, day one. Thanks everyone uh, for joining us. If you've been joining us the whole time. If you just popped in, hello, welcome. We'll be back uh tomorrow uh on a slight with a, di a different link but you can find that link still at humberstorylab.ca uh, there'll be a link uh that you can find there to our day two feed and uh, we'll begin uh introductions around 9 50 a.m and then uh proceed from 10 a.m to 4 with liberal breaks uh, and that's eastern standard time so thanks to everyone and uh have a great evening and thanks to Clara, of course. Thank you.